You're listening in on an animated discussion about Harley Quinn on DC Universe with three experts in their fields. I'm Joshua Unruh, superhero scholar. I'm Sarah Century, media critic and writer. I'm Avishai Weinberger, screenwriter. And today we'll be covering season one, episodes 10 through 13, The Big Finish. Right, friends, here we are, the home stretch, the final four episodes of season one, this season that just unexpectedly blew my mind and also the minds of my co-hosts, or at least we'll find out if it blew Sarah's mind because this is her first time going through the whole thing. Yes, it is. I can't wait to find out. <laughs> um, <laughs> Same. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So where are you now? You've seen it all the way to the end. Before we dig into the specifics, Sarah, how did the season wind up for you? Do you feel pretty good about it overall? Yeah, I liked it so much more than I thought I was going to. I definitely walked into the season being like, you know, I put it off for a really long time. There's things that I can't deal with emotionally <laughs> um, that early, <laughs> you know, I, w I saw that it was out and a lot of people said it was good. And I was just like, A, I don't think I'm going to like it. B, I'm just not emotionally prepared to watch, you know, something that is Harley Quinn based that I don't like right now. Uh, but it turned out really good. I thought that it was great. I've had a great time watching the episodes and then immediately having long discussions with you all um, <laughs> <laughs> right after I watched them. So now I can listen back to those episodes and always remember like what my immediate reaction was. So that's nice. Okay, good. You kept going because I was starting to feel like that was sarcasm. But as you kept going, I realized, oh, no, that's sincere. She is actually excited to have watched these and had these long conversations. <laughs> this happens constantly with me. People always don't know what a sincere person I am. <laughs> Well, uh, I have the problem where every time I try and sound sincere, I sound even more like I'm lying. So, you yeah. know, I try and give people the benefit of the doubt. It sounds, you know, when you start to talk about something sincere, people are just like, wait, they just said three jokes in a row. This has to be a joke, too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That is part of it. Yes. And I know that Avishai and I have seen this. I've I just accidentally wound up seeing this season four or five times at this point, honestly, with just like introducing it to new people. And I was curious, though, is this your second or third time all the way through Avishai? Where did you wind this up? This is my second time through. I watched it. Uh, okay. I watched it week by week when it originally came out and uh, mm -hmm. and just kind of went through it again to discuss it with you guys. And I picked up a whole lot more on the rewatch because the first time I watched it I basically I had two thoughts I thought this is this is a lot of fun and I have like sp notes in specific areas on the rewatch I, I'm appreciating what it does well more and the stuff that annoys me I guess I'm dissecting a little bit more than I would have otherwise uh -huh. um, yeah. yeah but I you know I thought that they uh, they stuck the landing uh, on the important elements and it it is a fun rewatch that's actually been and a pleasant surprise for me. I mean, I wind up having to watch things two and three and four times because I podcast about them, you know, and most things can't handle it. You know, it's too much all at once. But this this has actually worked out really well. Uh, a lot of my rewatches were introducing friends to the show, which is like a whole other sort of lens into it. You know, even if I know the joke is coming, I'm in the room with people who don't. And I will admit I'm, I'm probably going to need a bit of a break after this one, <laughs> but this is the first time I felt that way. And like I said, I'm four or five times into this. So that's pretty good. Pretty good marks for this, for all three of us, unexpectedly enjoyable show. <laughs> and, and like Sarah said, it's fun to have this sort of like book club afterwards. You know, let, let's, uh, let's, let's take this yeah. show intended to be pretty much just, you know, a fun time and dissect what makes it work, what doesn't, what are the psychological implications of the murder clown. It's great. I don't know that I've ever actually been in a book club, you know, um, but it is very enjoyable doing this with movies and TV shows that actually can kind of bear the weight. So, yeah, that's a that's an excellent comparison. Um, and I know a lot of listening to podcasts is basically uh, being in a book club with people that aren't directly responding to you, which may be a lot of people's book club experience now that I think about it. But I don't know. <laughs> anyway, diving into episode 10. I found episode 10 like a really fascinating sort of, uh, 
I don't know, like a side quest, you know, almost. It's it's not unrelated, but it's not as directly related. But before we get into Harley's trip home, uh, was anyone else just floored by the fact that Bane is like 100% more self-actualized than Harley is? <laughs> I love Bane. <laughs> I guess not, because I read Secret Six. So Sec- Secret Six Bane <laughs> is very self-actualized. Um, but yeah, he's kind of goofier in this in a way that I enjoy, too. And then he just shows up with all the best advice. It's just like, not very healthy. Might want to step away. I, you know, just Harley Instagram stalking her exes. I, I mean, this this also all feels like very relatable content. Yeah, I was wondering what their inspiration was. I was thinking that it must have been maybe them reading Secret Sex or something. But yeah, I, I kind of wondered because I think that's the only other time I've seen a Bane like this. Yeah, he seems he seems kind of different from the comics Bane that, that I'm used to, right? In the comics, he's a little bit more Machiavellian, a little, little more calculating. And here it, it seems like he has these really petty like grudges but and these little flashes of anger. But for the most part, he's... He seems a little bit more chill and a little bit goofier and a little bit like less, um, I guess, calculating. He's the kind of guy to tell a bad joke at a party and get upset if nobody laughs. But I, 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 I can't. Because <laughs> political correctness right. is ruining comedy. That's well, why. I, I can't see him being the Bane in the comics who has this whole plan to break the Batman. Like here, it seems like he'll stub his toe and just like blow up the room he's in because that's the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> So that's that's a fun that's a fun take on him. I don't know if it really has its hooks in any version of him that I've read. Yeah, I'd say basically just like the character work that Gail Simone did in Secret Six, and that's honestly the only one <laughs> that springs to mind for me either. So yeah, it's interesting. This is the Bane that I really like, though. So I'm glad, you know, it makes a lot of sense for me to have a character like that, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit like what what they did with King Shark, you know, where it's we have this character who has such a specific characterization in the comics for the most part. Um, let's kind of lean into the, the road less traveled. And if Gail Simone set up, set him up as a little bit more self-actualized, you know, I, I, I can see them like sort of running with that in a way that they have the freedom to do it because it's not canon. Totally. Yeah. We've mentioned this a few times before and Bane doesn't quite fit this mold exactly, but this idea that these writers get to do things because they're not working within an established canon other than their own, but that they are really nailing aspects that we, at least the three of us who, you know, are into this stuff, but kind of have not super similar viewpoints on, you know, it's not like all three of us are coming from the same place and saying, yeah, that's our Superman. We're coming from different places and saying that's our Superman. And even if, yeah, this isn't a Bane I can see existing very far outside of this iteration of Harley Quinn, it's great for this. And, and it is very much, I think a wake up call to Harley that Bane is the one who comes in and talks sense to her. Like that has to, that has to get her attention. Like, oh my God, Bane is giving advice and it's good. What is my life? They they seem, I feel like they have a little bit more license to play with the villains than the heroes because the heroes seem to pretty much be like, if like straight authentic adaptations of these characters, maybe a little goofier for the sake of comedy, but they're still like Batman is Batman, Superman is Superman, and I feel like with the villains, like with, say, Scarecrow and Bane and, and whatnot, they can just kind of reinvent them as they see fit, because these are these are characters who will actually be playing real roles in this show and not just sort of supporting, popping up every so often to remind us that we're in the DC universe. That's a good take. Can't argue with that. So, in much the same way that it's kind of, I think, probably a surprise to Harley that Bane is making this much sense, and that's very relatable content, like, oh no, my friend that never makes sense is now making sense, clearly I have a lot of problems. I feel like you can always go home and mom will look after you is also relatable content for a lot of people. Maybe not everybody, it's not universal, but it makes sense. And it's advice given to her by her psychologist self, right? (laughs) <laughs> so it must be good. There's no way that it's a that it's possibly a mistake if the same part of your brain is telling you to do it. But it's especially interesting yeah. that it's that it's something that she comes to herself, right? It might be a, a different part of her mind, but 
it's not like anybody else is telling her to do something she especially doesn't want to do. She herself, some part of her wants to go back to her family that she hates. Yeah, um, I can definitely say that the only part of that conversation that I heard was the part where her other self was like, there's always somebody who will love and support you. And Harley's like, yeah, but she won't even answer my <laughs> yes. text right now. And I was like, uh-huh. shipping, shipping. <laughs> but yeah, I was for that, I guess. It's not surprising at all to me on any level how often we wind up with Harley and Ivy recognizing that the other one is their person. Uh, they, I mean, they, they don't quite come out and realize it fully, but it's a very these little bits. Gabrielle matchup where it just takes seasons, but eventually. <laughs> yes. I, I made a note of this also. I, I, I do think it was shrewd on the part of the writers to remember that, <laughs> to remember that her first thought of who was there for me is Ivy. And I'm glad that they kept it as a thread throughout the episode of her trying to reach Ivy by text. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I, we've, we've, we've either all been there or know someone who's been there, <laughs> or, you know? So it, it, yeah, it absolutely. that felt authentic. Complete sidebar, is anybody else kind of surprised that Harley's home is in Bensonhurst, which is a real place and not like some Gotham-type made-up fictional town? Because <laughs> it should be made up. It should be totally a fake place if it's a Harley Quinn place. How far from Gotham is Brooklyn? <laughs> Wow, yeah, this is this is the questions we need to be asking because they have no answer. I feel like every time I've looked at a map of Gotham, I've been like, I don't know. <laughs> this doesn't look like the other map of Gotham I've seen. The only reason I really ask is because I live in Brooklyn and I'm recording from Brooklyn and I'm like, oh, okay, so I guess I guess this is right by me. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, Sarah, I find it really fascinating that you say and there are no answers because let me tell you once upon a time there were answers and it Uh was worse when we had answers oh yeah yeah because once upon a time it seemed like a good idea to make metropolis basically new york and make gotham basically somewhere mysterious in New Jersey, (laughs) right across a bay from metropolis like you could literally look from one city to the other across this bay isn't that how it is in the animated series? I don't remember 100%, but I think that there's, in the Superman animated series, I think that there's like a world's finest cartoon or something where they, yes. it's like right there. <laughs> it is not that way in the animated series. And I know because we've covered that, uh, my regular co-host and I have covered that on an animated discussion. So I know it's not there. Uh-huh. Uh, they seem to be far enough away that, you know, people have to take jets and things. But... In Lego Batman 3, they bring all that back because you can actually go to the water's edge and look across and the sun is always up over Metropolis and it's never up over (laughs) Gotham. (laughs) But I've always been a little leery of when DC tried to really figure out where these places were. Like, just be generically Eastern Seaboard because putting Gotham in New Jersey is sort of... I don't know. Either you're making a joke at New Jersey's expense and hasn't New Jersey had enough (laughs) or you're making a joke at the expense of Gotham. And then aren't you kind of a jerk? I mean, you know, it's like (laughs) just be generally Eastern seaboard. (laughs) I mean, you know, typically speaking, I guess in the movies, Gotham and Metropolis are both New York's. It's like West New York, East New York. I have no idea, but you know, it's, they're, they're not all that different except for their color schemes. Like, they both still have their massive towers and their high-tech billionaires. And, you know, it, it, they're, they're not super different. It's just that you don't know where to place them. And it, it, t- tell me if I'm wrong, but wasn't how, – have they always been geographically next to each other? Or was that a recent thing? Because I, I thought that that was a more recent thing and the comics never really addressed it until recently. In my experience, it wasn't that way in the beginning. It was that way for a long time through the mid 70s into the like mid to late 80s. And then it's not that way again. And and this is hard to say exactly because it may change with next month's issue of something, honestly. But uh, but yeah, I think that the the proximity, the close proximity of Gotham and Metropolis is something that has come and gone and is currently gone, I think. Mm. I think Metropolis is Los Angeles and Gotham is Seattle. There, solved. 
okay, if I had it to do all over again, <laughs> here's your behind the scenes. Josh has a pitch. You mm-hmm. know, uh, if I had to do it all over again, I would 100 percent put uh, Metropolis on the West Coast, not just to spread out the DC universe a little bit, but also because it's supposed to be the city of tomorrow. And I would go a lot harder for, you know, it being a bastion of tech. So I would move it out west and leave Gotham on the east and let Gotham just be the New York, except, you know, when DC decides to send the Titans to New York or something, because that happens. Right. This is a weird sidebar. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Actually, I have a I have a question about this because um, I was under the impression, and this is very much a pop cultural impression. Okay, so I'm asking you, Avishai, specifically because both of your uh, like lived experience and also where you live, your lived experience is that I was under the impression pop culturally that Bensonhurst is a Jewish neighborhood or maybe was a Jewish neighborhood when I was, you know, when that pop culture was being created. Am I making that up? Is that out of nowhere or am I on to something? So if I'm wrong about this, it's entirely on me. It could be that I have blind spots. I've never really had that. I, that's never really been a thing for me. It never comes up in conversation about Bensonhurst being a Jewish neighborhood. It's maybe it was once. I, to be honest, I don't really know anything about Bensonhurst. I know about Teaneck, you know, I know about New Rochelle. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know about Bensonhurst. I, I really don't. That that could just be my own personal blind spot. I, I don't know. It's not my part of Brooklyn. I didn't expect you to know everything. I just, like I said, I had this vague pop cultural impression of that. I don't um, know anything about Bensonhurst. Nothing. And uh, again, that could just be about the circles I'm in, but in Jewish conversations about where the population centers are, um, hasn't really come up. Okay, just in case, just to see if I'm maybe not as out on a limb here as, as it's looking like I am. Sarah, have you run into this? Are you familiar with Bensonhurst pop culturally? Does it feel like a Jewish neighborhood? Or like I say, am I all alone here? I have no idea. <laughs> okay, all right. Now, I know I've run into this in more than one place, but I can actually point to a specific reference. So I know that I'm not like completely off base, but maybe it isn't as pervasive as I've, you know, again, there's so much pop culture. You stumble into whatever you stumble into. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. So but when I first watched this episode, that's what I had in mind. Like I, I that seemed to make sense to me again, pop culturally, if not in reality, for her to go home and for it to be, you know, to Bensonhurst. And I think it's nice if not everybody is a Gotham native, you know? I just looked it up on Wikipedia and um, apparently it is a, a, a Jewish enclave. It seems to mostly be Italian. Um, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, just that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's probably part of it. They wanted to get her outside of Gotham so that she wouldn't know what was going on there. And Bensonhurst makes a certain amount of sense, if you know a little something about Bensonhurst. They wanted the whole uh, mob owing owing mob debts and taking out mob loans, et cetera, like, that, all, like, like illegal gambling. They wanted that, and I guess Bensonhurst lends itself towards those stereotypes. Um, so sure, you know, sure. They, they might have reverse engineered that. Did anyone else notice that Harley's accent is significantly more pronounced once she gets home? When she talks to her mom. That's how it is, right? That I mean, my family is from the South, so I can't say specifically, but uh, yeah, I mean, your my uh, my drawl comes back a little bit more just because you're <laughs> around people who are talking that way. Yeah, I just I noticed, and it and the reason I noticed I think is because it's maybe the first time since the first episode. Like now, I kind of want to go back and check the first episode to see how she sounded at the very beginning. But it's maybe the first time that I felt that they were kind of trying to nod at Arlene Sorkin. Like the rest of the time, they've really just been letting her be, you know, this version of Harley. But mm-hmm. that one felt like a nod back to the roots. And again thinking Bensonhurst was a Jewish neighborhood and obviously her family is Jewish. And I was like, ah, yes, again, relatable content. It seemed a little bit less like a, the like an Arlene Sorkin nod than something they do a little bit later in the season where they just go for a full-on impersonation. But in this moment, yeah, she it does, it does get more pronounced, but it gets pro- pronounced more in arguments. And oh, and yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I read that, you know, like, like Sarah says, you come home. Um, and when you kind of fall back into the old patterns that you grew up in, 
you might even you might slip into the accent a little bit. Uh, it, it's it's their way of showing that they have a dynamic that's pre-existed this show and that it's second nature to them to the point where it's entirely involuntary. Excellent writing. It really is. That's a good point. Like there's a, just a lot wrapped up in this relatively small choice of a more pronounced accent. I wonder if it's in the script or if it was the directing. It's possible that the director talked to the actors and said, like, when you come home, how much of your sort of native self comes out. Um, And I'd be curious to know if that's on the page or not. Another thing that I found fascinating personally about Harley going home was the discovery that Well, a lot of things from her backstory, like, for instance, we saw some of this when we were in her mind, but that she was never a good kid. Like she was always a person who was, you know, very angry or willing to do shady things or, you know, whatever the situation called for. Um, And it was interesting to me to see that there are roots of that in her parents, you know, and we've talked about how we don't love that the person who is abused as a child, as far as pop culture or pulp fiction is concerned, you know, always has to grow up to be a serial killer or someone who also abuses or, you know, whatever. But it's it's interesting to see that Harley kind of grows up to be this person because she started out with people that weren't great examples to start with you know it's a little more relatable and believable i think than the everyone who is abused as a child grows up to be a monster that's terrible but this feels real right yeah i think it does as well i think that the biggest thing to emphasize with her parents is is that they don't seem like they hit her you know they don't seem like they do a lot of screaming or anything like that happens a little bit here but it doesn't seem like she was um, punished really actively. And and I'm not sure if that's something that they're just prudently not, <laughs> you know, showing or if, um, you know, if it just was a different kind of abuse. So I think that the fact that they emphasize how much emotional neglect there is and the fact that her parents really just don't give it right? Like they don't care about her at all. And that's interesting because that shows a lot about who Harley becomes, right? Yes, yes. I thought that her dad manipulating her into losing the gymnastics competition felt very proto-Joker, like proto-Joker relationship, uh, emotionally manipulative for someone else's ends. Like give up this thing that's very important to you for me. Because that shows me that you love me, right? Which is very important because whether they love her or not never comes up, right? We never talk about it almost even with like, you know, Joker, her dad, whether or not they care about her, even though they very clearly don't, is never a topic of conversation. But Mm -hmm. does she care about them? How can she prove that she cares about them? That's like classic manipulation tactics. Yeah, And it's interesting because in that moment where he tells her to take a dive, He's more, uh, you know, he, he's more uh, forthright about it with her than the Joker would have been, right? He doesn't try to make it seem as if it's her idea. Mm. He doesn't try to make it seem as if it is for a particularly greater good. He's just like, listen, I bet against you because you're the you're the heavy favorite, and if I if you lose, I'm going to lose a finger. So I need you to. I, I, if you win, if you win, I'm going to lose a finger. So I need you to lose. Like he's not being dishonest he's just putting an uh, an unfair kind of pressure on her in the rest of the episode though when he's trying to manipulate her into essentially being on his side again and trusting him again um again assuming that she ever did um that is a little bit more jokery right like that is more like finding Mm -hmm. the, the the flaw in her in her psyche and exploiting it right that's more through subterfuge but in in that flashback i thought it was interesting that they went out of their way to say he told her that why he was doing it, what he was doing, that it was all for him and not at all for her. And then as soon as she takes the dive, she, uh, you know, we're, we're shown that she beat him up, right? She doesn't just take it. She's very upset at him and actually just, yeah. like, pummels him. And, you know, that, that, that like, like you said, that, that shows us how she's always had that part of her but it also shows that it was a more kind of antagonistic relationship and a lot less of a sort of controlling one if that makes sense 
Mm. I think mm-hmm. that there's something important to say about how manipulation works with honesty, though. Mm. People can choose when to be honest. And that is always something that I think a lot of manipulators do. Like you hear manipulators say stuff like, I'm not going to lie to you. And then they tell you like their story. And then while they might be telling you the truth there, there's other lies surrounding that, right? Right. Because you get the idea, it comes out of nowhere, but he must have known about it. You know, he must have known about it for a long time. And he's just telling her right before she's about to do it. That is very clever emotional manipulation that, you know, it utilizes honesty and relies on honesty. And I think that that's... Kind of, you know, something that we really don't see that much in television or when people talk about these situations at all, how like somebody can tell you the truth, but they choose when to do it. And that that is in itself, you know, uh, abusive and exploitative. Well, yeah. And it's it's interesting that in that moment, he, you know, it, it, it is clever to tell her this right at the last minute because that is manipulative, it seems almost clumsily clever. Like, I could believe right. that he just didn't have a plan and just, like, didn't tell her until now, not because he was waiting till the right moment, but, but because he just, like, didn't plan out when to tell her and sort of screwed up waiting to the last minute. Um, so it's 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 demanding and it's abusive and it's manipulative, but it's a lot less shrewd than the Joker ever is. But there is that line, like, mm-hmm. what you're saying reminds me of that line that um, when Harley learns that her parents got back together... Um, when, uh, you know, she, she tells her, her mom, but he broke every promise yeah. he ever made. And she says, but then he apologized for those and made a bunch of new ones. <laughs> you know, like that, that's, that is what you're saying. Right. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's always very interesting. I think that obviously one of the most important things about watching the show, and we touched on it a little bit before, but is just showing the many capacities of abuse, right? The mm. way that it can fill all of these different forms in people's lives and how you can get really good at avoiding one kind of abuse and then completely fall into a, another abuse trap because you just didn't you know, there people are really good at manipulating. (laughs) And so, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like they might be in manipulating themselves, even there's there's a lot of complicated stuff going on whenever you talk about this. So I love the fact that they have worked so hard to address that. I think that that's one of the most important parts of the show, because if they didn't get that complicated with this stuff, then you know, we would do the same thing a lot of people do. And we'd be dismissing Harley and kind of writing her off because she wouldn't have this depth where we go, not only is this somebody who is being manipulated since they were a child, but they it happened in different ways by different people. Mm, right. And I like that she's uh, she she doesn't learn in this episode that she should dislike her father, right? She doesn't like realize that she's been idolizing somebody who's been abusing her. She starts the episode hating him. And the worst thing that he does in this episode is almost convincing her that maybe he's worth trusting. But it's it's interest, It's a contrast to the Joker because when she's with the Joker, it took forever to realize that actually he he never loved her and he's he's a terrible abuser. Here she's al- she's always hated her father and is very vocal about it. And the worst thing that her father does is say, "I have changed," and almost make her believe it. The big, the the big mm. betrayal is her mom because she starts off, you know, Harley starts off the episode um, thinking that she can go back to her mom at any time, and then her mom not only is back together with her dad, but is also completely willing to murder her. Like that's that's the real backstab. <laughs> Right. And I think that that speaks to the complicity, right, that you feel towards parents, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, whenever there's, um, you know, and this it's once again, this is incredibly complicated, because obviously, people who are stuck with somebody who just manipulates and lies and things like that, that has an effect on her mom, obviously, there's no way it couldn't, you know, we don't really see the extent of what's going on with her mom. But, you know, being repeatedly lied to (laughs) is difficult. And so, you know, it's hard to say exactly what the full ramifications of that are with her. But just the fact that, you know, when you're a kid and the Per, the other parent isn't as abusive, but they don't help you whenever the the parent who is abusive is abusing, then that leads to a lot of resentment in a lot of people. And it's interesting that Harley doesn't have that. She doesn't have any anger towards her mom, from what I can tell in the beginning. Mm. Um, it, but, you know, her mom did break up with him or they, they were separated for a long time. So maybe that's why it's easier for her to view her mom in that stance, I guess. 
Yeah, for sure. I want to step back to a thematic choice that they made of how they would introduce Harley's childhood and upbringing with that sitcom opening. And I want to go back to that because it is so tremendously bleak, but it's put under this like very chipper, happy sitcom, you know, kind of icing over what is otherwise a pretty terrible rotten cake. You know, um, her brother dying is part of the the happy jaunty song. And she even references him like, I wanted to come back where I was loved and mentions her brother's ashes, you know, as one of the things that love her. That sitcom opening is just like extraordinarily bleak. I thought, D- did you guys have any kind of a strong reaction to that? Or am I am I all alone? Well, on did, that? Are we supposed to take it that her brother committed suicide? That's that's my read of it. Yeah, in the comics, her brother is just a jackass and doesn't have a job and has kids and doesn't take care of anybody. And he's really rude and mean to her all of the time. Here, I'm pretty sure that the implication was that he died by suicide, which, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, that (laughs) that being revealed, I guess, in this way was, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's no denying that that is one of the bleakest parts of this already incredibly bleak show. (laughs) It's a it's a pretty big thing to turn into a throwaway joke. Right. I mean, when we're seeing the montage of them growing up, we see him and his sort of descent into what's like clearly depression and then cut to his ashes. And then it's kind of not addressed. And I guess you can't really ask this show to address that. But, you know, good Lord. (laughs) You know, I'll say I don't think it's a throwaway joke. So I'm going to I'm going to put I think there's absolutely a joke that's gone for there by framing it in the sitcom opening. But in much the same way that we get a very sane Dr. Harleen Quinzel showing up, I think that this is a little bit of Harley as unreliable narrator, right? This is a little bit of Harley cleaning up her own past, you know, like making it seem more as sitcom as possible. But she also knows the real truth. So she can only kind mm-hmm. of, you know, right. spackle over the horror show a little bit. Um, but she's trying And maybe she shouldn't be trying to brighten it up. Right. I think a lot of abusive households present in a way that is very wholesome. And then you find out years later that the, you know, terrible things were happening in that house and nobody knew Mm -hmm. about it. Uh, So, I mean, that's kind of maybe a clever analogy, I guess, for that already. And just kind of that need to present and that need to kind of make yourself believe that things are good. Whenever, obviously, you know, there's terrible things that nobody else sees. And I also think it sets up a lot of the rest of what we've talked about with her background, right? Like talking about the gymnastics and her dad being manipulative and her mom obviously not defending her enough. It really sets us up from the beginning to realize that all of the seeds that would become Harley Quinn were planted when she was growing up. And it's really only the Joker that showed up and sort of watered the seeds. I may be reading more into that than there is there textually, but I I thought it was a really interesting look. And for a character who is so often thought of just as Joker's girlfriend, you know, that we're always trying to uh, either put her back into his shadow or take her out of the Joker's shadow, for this show to go so hard towards, no, a lot of what made her Harley was there before he showed up. He just did the last little bit. And I can't decide if that's what they were going for on purpose and that that's part of her self-empowerment, that the, the realization that she's the one who jumped into the acid, you know, that kind of thing. I made the choice or it's my stuff that I brought here. You know, I think it's there to be read that way, but I'm not sure that I'm ready to die on that hill. But I just did you guys see anything like that or am I just sounding like I don't know what I'm talking about? I mean, I think that a lot of what they do purposefully here is to establish her autonomy. And obviously we've talked about that. And, you know, we've talked about that quite a bit, actually, through this, right, is just addressing all of the moments of autonomy that Harley has and how those aren't necessarily always actual choices that she's given. Here she Mm -hmm. has a terribly abusive family. She has no choice but to react in some way to that situation. You know, she can't necessarily do things in an emotionally mature way whenever she really hasn't been given those tools, right? But then it's also who is she and, you know, 
how would she go forward in, if she weren't in these situations, which is something that a lot of times, you know, you ask yourself, you, there's no answer. This is another question where you just like, you'll never get to the end of how things could have gone for you. And so I think that just that marriage is something like that, the combining of those different elements, how you can look back and go, this probably played a pretty big part in my development, but then we never really know, you know, nature versus nurture and stuff like that. They do bring that stuff up again and again through this. And I think that, you know, what we walk away with is, is that basically that she is a highly autonomous character but then once again, that we can never dismiss that that would leave you susceptible to abuse still. You know, everybody is susceptible to abuse and being manipulated. So I think that, yeah, I don't know. I think it's so important that they established her as being as strong as she is and being as, uh, you know, sporadic, impulsive, difficult to control because someone did control her. And that's, you know, that's how it works in life. You know, people can be really strong and still suffer this stuff. So, yeah, I don't know. I think that it's always. <laughs> yep. I appreciate that they, they did the work to show that the Joker didn't create her personality for her. That she wasn't just straight-laced Harleen Quinzel's psychiatrist. Psychologist? Psychiatrist? What is she? Well, she's a doctor. She's a doctor. So I think uh, unless, it's, unless it's a PhD in psychology psychiatrists have to at least be mostly a medical doctor i'm really okay not an expert <laughs> well that's a, anyway i digress but she she wasn't straight laced dr harleen quinzel jump to a vat of acid come out with a whole new accent and personality and an and anarchic sense of just screw everything and uh, athletics you know like all like all of that was yeah. already in her um and i I appreciate that because a character is defined by the choices they make, right? Not by their personality. And if this has always been her personality and she chose to be on one path before and has now taken this choice, it shows that she could always do either one. She's still going to be who she, who she is on the inside, but the, what she does on the outside is what defines her, and she has the potential to be either. So the Joker might have set her off on a path of turning her destructive tendencies into super villainy right that was always in her she can decide if she's going to do that in the service of in the service of the joker in the service of herself or if she's just going to bury that as much as possible to the degree to the degree that she can and have it explode out of her every so often um so that the show has been doing the work on that they've been doing it since the episode that we jumped into her head um and even when she is current day harley quinn we are reminded that she contains multitudes, right? She is a doctor. She does have this past. She has, she has an understanding of how people work. Um, and some versions of the character kind of forget that where they say it's, it's almost like Dr. Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde, you know, here it's, it's one human just making different choices um, and under different manipulative circumstances. Once again, I am pleasantly surprised at how unexpectedly deep this cartoon about breaking limbs and goofy supervillain antics turns out to be. I, we said it a couple of episodes ago, but this writing staff is really very good at looking at the stuff that they want to look at. Right. And I think we're, you know, we're seeing that here because we're seeing all of these things, not just a lot of personality things, but a lot of like the gymnastics also didn't, you know, spring forth wholly formed because of the Joker, her outfit when she's, competing is a Harley Quinn outfit years before she was going to be Harley Quinn. Like all of these breadcrumbs, all of these, you know, steps along the path. Uh, the Joker is just another step on that path instead of the biggest and most important and only, you know, step on that path, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting at that point, uh, in a way, Harley is, uh, much more well adjusted even as Harley than either Joker or Batman are because the Joker is when we bother to give him a, a backstory, you know, defined by one moment of tragedy. And so is Batman, really. I have a topic I want to discuss um, that's related to this episode, but not related to that point. This is the last episode, I think, that really kind of delves into Harley's Jewishness at all. And the only one that that, yes. in, that that dives into it, but it's the only it's the last one that really kind of uses it for 
humor that I find slightly uncomfortable. I want to hear your thoughts on that because there was a lot of really interesting casual racism going on from Harley's parents towards Italian and Irish. So I was wondering how that folded into this tiny glimpse of Harley's Jewishness that we get, you know? So yeah, um, please, please tell us some more about your thoughts on Harley's Jewishness, because this is, you're right, this is kind of it as far as a real close look at it. So this episode was the first time that I actually knew at all that she was Jewish. I never knew that from comic books. I never knew it from earlier in the show. So when I got to this episode, that was a surprise to me. And it, the way it, it, it's played, I think, is a little less than perfect. Like, so, some of the jokes here did make me laugh. I will I will admit that her her mom making that joke about how she's she's sucking face with that goyish clown, like, that did make me laugh. Um, <laughs> now, that, that aside... It is, it is, again, a case of a character's um, kind of ethnic identity being used more as a joke than as character, right? Or even just within, her, within mm-hmm. Harley herself, right? The fact that she was a, uh, a psychiatrist, um, that is played for character, right? We learn more about her as a human being from that. Her background as a nightmare child, like that, that is something that explains a lot about her. That's something that we go mm-hmm. into. Her background as a gymnast, that like that's more superficial, but that still gives us something. It explains why she's so capable in that in that in that sense. The, her Jewishness here is used entirely as a joke, and it's applied to her. It doesn't come from her. It's just her parents dipping into some stereotypes. Like her mom wants wants her to marry a. Jewish doctor and she wants to set him up with a with a she wants to set her up with a dentist who lives down the street. It's it's all superficial. It's just a joke. And if it were on a show with a slightly better track record of jokes like this, I would probably be a little bit less uncomfortable with it. I'm uncomfortable with it in this context. Especially since, you know, upon rewatch, knowing where this is going, everything about her childhood that we see through her like inner mind or through that montage at the beginning of this episode, there's nothing Jewish about it. Like I don't see, I don't see any Jewish milestones. Like I, I, I suppose it. They probably would have done it for laughs still, but was she bat mitzvah? Did she have a a temple? Did she go to Did she go to school and learn anything Jewish? Was she completely separated from all that? Her, I mean, there are Jews who are completely secular. Like that, that is a thing. But the way her mom talks, I don't think that's this family. So it's bizarre to see it as a superficial joke used to use not to define her character but just to make the show funny and then to kind of ignore it on the character side now you know also the fact that her dad you know is a terrible human and a racist again you know he he or or a bigot in general like he he his both of her parents really just hate irish people that upset my my sister um from a jewish standpoint a little bit more than me because she was upset like okay we have the out jewish characters on this show and they're all just horrible bigots um, it upset me slightly less just because at least that's not connected to their Jewishness. But I do see her point. And I, part of me wishes that they had done a little bit more work to delve into this. And part of me wishes that they just sort of pulled back a little bit more. I think that's a completely reasonable reaction on your part. You know, I mean, wanting it to either be done better and well or just not be done at all instead of this kind of middle path makes total sense to me. I think that Harley Quinn as a Jewish character is super important and that I just basically wish that there could be, you know, maybe some Jewish writers on (laughs) Harley, I guess. I think there are. I don't have no idea, you know, who wrote. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I have no idea who wrote this. In the comics, uh, there are some times, but it's not very regular. And, you know, uh, comics and Jewish identities, it's kind of a rocky road you know we have like kitty pride <laughs> there's a few people ben Grimm, you know but uh yeah i don't know there just isn't a lot of representation and then of course you had you know the stories of jack kirby being kind of like forced to make non-jewish type characters and like all of that so i feel like comics has kind of a reckoning that they need to come to <laughs> with this uh but also that it's kind of unfortunate i guess to see it kind of spread you know in other medias that are based on you know characters that i mean yeah we talked about it before harley quinn's pretty much always been jewish uh 
So, yeah, I don't know. It kind of bummed me out a little bit, I guess, and made me be like, it'll be nice, you know, if uh, if it's a little bit different going forward. Yeah. <laughs> and it's uh, it, it, it is odd in the context of this show, the way that they that they play these jokes. Uh, you know, yeah. there, there's there's a version of this that plays more into it. There's a version like there there's a joke in this one episode, right, where we have the Italian mobsters who have one scene, and they open the scene by saying a bunch of stereotypical things, and then saying um, that is a list of stereotypes that we should all av- avoid falling into, right? Like the joke about we we're writing stereotypical Italians, but we're trying, but we're lampshading the fact that they're stereotypes. I, I wrote in my notes while I was watching this episode, could they do that with the Jews? Like, can they lampshade the fact that they're, uh-huh. that they're falling into these stereotypes instead of earnestly falling into them? Yeah. The more closely we look at this show, the more inexplicable it becomes to me that they're going to make this many jokes either either legitimately built from a Jewish experience or an experience that non-Jews can share with Jews, like Joshua's bar mitzvah, or they're going to build it out of these over-the-top stereotypes, but they're never going to apply either one directly to Harley, really. Outside of the accent, it's her parents that do all of the, you know, air quotes, Jewish things in this episode, and she didn't even act like she knew what was going on at, at, you know, at Joshua's bar mitzvah. Like she didn't have any kind of inside track, you know, that she, to give to Ivy or some, you know, some way that they could have demonstrated that my ongoing mystification at the fact that they're going to make Jewishness such a big part of the show and not such a big part of Harley. It's, it's, it just boggles the more I think about it. Yeah. But it's like we said, you know, in, in, in previous episodes of this podcast, they're using the Jewishness as a, as a joke and just as a joke. And that's what they're interested in. They're yeah. not really interested in diving yeah. in deeper. And, you know, there, there there are little things that also Jews will notice that, that non-Jews might not. Like, if they are a Jewish household, even if they're secular, but her mom is clearly still in the stereotypical Jewish mom mode, where are the mezuzahs on the door? Like, like things like that. So it's, mm. it's, 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 little, it's little things and, you know... I wonder to what degree they're falling into this trap for other for other minority groups. Um, right. It could be it could be equal. I don't know, but this this is the one that keeps jumping out to me, and it's it's. I have to continue uh, compartmentalizing on this show. You know, we said that in our last episode that we'd be really interested to hear from other minorities who may be getting made fun of in this series, right? Like to see what is what are the things that we are missing not being part of those groups. Um, and I, and I think there's almost certainly some stuff that we're missing, but I think it's also this, that, that scene with the Italian mobsters is really telling that we're going to go ahead and make a joke about the fact that we're making a joke and that we don't really do that in other instances like Jewishness that we have a lot more opportunity to do it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I am not by any stretch going to start trying to ascribe intent or motive to anybody, but it is sort of interesting what's bubbling out, what continues to be an ongoing issue with the show that probably, I don't want to say happened by happenstance, like nobody has to take responsibility, but almost certainly nobody set out the day they started making the show to do that. Oh, I don't think there's any malice behind it. Uh, I think it's right. I think it's an easy, it's, it's, it's an easy trap to fall into. Uh, And I would definitely be curious to talk to one of the writers to kind of, to kind of take, take the temperature of that room. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, this is the last time in the show that I'm, that I find it particularly upsetting. Like even going forward, Psy is played more into old man stereotypes than Jew stereotypes. Um, and the only other Jewish joke that I kind of twigged on the show that comes in the second to last episode is a joke that I think is completely harmless and made me laugh just totally out of any, out of any, (laughs) out of any context, because if you're going to make a Jew joke, at least don't do it at the expense of Jews and that joke doesn't <laughs> and just kind of a, a for you know skipping ahead it's when Clayface decides to become grandfather wolf to placate grandma wolf <laughs> from Little Red Riding Hood and he takes a swing and decides to make him Jewish and I laughed at that I thought that was funny um there's no there's no target of that joke except for Clayface yeah and Clayface really is shown to be completely clueless about what he's actually doing as psycho points out just how bad his response is 
that is a male wolf in a in <laughs> women's clothing. I mean, you know, like there is no part of that disguise that Clayface thought through enough. But also Clayface goes out of his way to add unnecessary detail to his characters. So that's that's right, that, right. that's what the joke is. He's adding unnecessary detail. The joke isn't, ha, huh, look at those funny Jews. Aren't they a mess? Yeah, and every character that he builds is just like the three things that he knows <laughs> about, you know, like the Oklahoma <laughs> cowboy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's always kind of based on stereotypes, but in a very genuine actory way. So yeah, I would agree that the clayface jokes are usually pretty harmless because they are they're all based on stereotypes, even if it's you know Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Nobody has to worry about hurting my feelings about Oklahoma stereotypes. No, nobody was going to. (laughs) Most of them, most of them are accurate. So, um. yeah, unfortunately, (laughs) as somebody who's been through Oklahoma a few times, (laughs) there's going to be some Oklahoma jokes. Mm -hmm. I accept them humbly. So I had I had one more observation uh, about Harley's time at home, um, which doesn't mean it has to be the last one forever, but this is the last one that I had. And it's something that's kind of been on my mind throughout the entire series, but Harley really takes a licking and keeps on ticking, oh, yeah. you know, and I felt like between a gunshot wound and a, and well, we get some more stab wounds later. But I mean, she's literally in the kitchen scalding her wound shut and it, and never pauses, you know, like that's it immediately goes into using that the teapot as a weapon. Also, like it, it's just she's so hardcore and. I guess I appreciate the fact that they just let that go uncommented on. I mean, except for when somebody makes a joke about she's just a weak woman. I mean, we're going to get that with Ivy, you know, soon. But that's a joke. And it's and it's such an obvious joke, because in that moment, Ivy is kicking the ass of everybody. And the whole rest of the series, we've watched Harley just really be physically tough on top of everything else. So I don't know that I had a big observation attached to that as much as that was sort of the pinnacle up to that point. And it just made me sit back and think about all the other times that she had taken a real beating and stood back up and kept swinging. And I think that's a really cool character beat also for her. Yeah, um, Harley Quinn's fight scenes across media is some of the best fight scenes that you've ever seen because they're always like that. They're always just complete it shows from beginning to end she doesn't see it coming she like you know gets horribly injured in the first moments of the fight (laughs) she you know survives by swinging from like you know a whatever in the uh what is it like a telephone post or something like that she does all kinds of bonkers things in her fights and a she would have to that is part of what makes her character believable because she's around all of these people who have so so many superpowers and the only reason that harley survives fights pretty much is because she is that hardcore she wouldn't be able to otherwise and you know they have her be in a i don't think on this but she's in a roller derby team you know in the comic yeah which yeah yeah, that makes sense and i think in the movie as well but yeah i think that it's always something that you would have to have with a character like that but it also just makes for some of the most entertaining fight scenes because she doesn't have healing powers like deadpool or wolverine you know they have those every deadpool and wolverine story that they tell they're like and now he's getting crushed by a semi truck (laughs) but now he's fine you know and they kind of just make a big point of putting their body through things that you would never be able to survive from harley is always taking hits that you could survive from but it would be terrible and it would make the fight really awful and agonizing for you so i think that that's great i love the way that they orchestrate harley fights and that this series does it just as well as any of the other media you know one of the best things about birds of prey is every the movie is every single character fights differently so whenever you get to watch the you know big fight scene of all of them fighting then you get to see really different personalities come out in fights and that is really cool so yeah i'm i'm extremely enthusiastic by that observation i guess because it's just so consistent and such a cool part of harley quinn because you don't get to see you know, you have like Wonder Woman who can fight, but you know, most of the time you don't see her kind of just having these really interesting fights. You know, the fights that she has a lot of times are her kind of versus characters like the Cheetah or something like that. You know, they're different, different, in- interesting, but this is more uh, dirty, I guess, <laughs> and it's always <laughs> really fun to watch. I wanted, I was, I was going to bring up that that movie also because. 
I, I, maybe we read the same. It, it, did, did you read that interview? I think it was with the stunt coordinator about which kind of fighting style they modeled each character's fighting style after. I didn't read about it. It was uh, just something that I noticed uh-huh. while I was yeah. watching it. But I'd be interested yeah. to read that. Yeah, they, I mean, me they too. Did a great I'm job. in the same boat. Like I noticed, but if there's more to be known, I would know it. Right. In in that interview, I think they said that they modeled Harley's fighting after uh, Drunken Master, <laughs> which. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think I did hear something about that. And of course, that's so great. Yeah. And it does it does make it so much more interesting than just, you know, kick, punch, punch, power. Side note on this topic, um, talking about how much damage Harley takes in this episode, it really felt like sort of the all is lost moment of a feature, doesn't it? Right? Like we're, uh, you know, in the sort of home stretch of the series and she's at her lowest point where she's lost all of her friends. Mm-hmm. And now her she she has no family. She has nowhere to go. And I think it's telling, and honestly, kudos to the writers, that the most damage that she gets in this show in any given episode is not from the Joker or from the Legion of Doom. It's from her parents. She's left outside, beat, battered and bruised, and it's it completely matches how she feels on the inside. And it happens right before kind of we kind of lilt back up for the climax when we have to take on the bad guys i Mm -hmm. i i think i think they they did a great job with this yeah i totally agree i think that it's a great harley quinn fight because it's that's who she lets get close to her and then this is what happens (laughs) i also appreciated her killing the assassin (laughs) at the beginning and just using her body as a shield and stuff that was all pretty fun to watch actually um but yeah, I don't know. I thought so too. I agree with everybody's takes. She wins by creativity, right? I oh, mean, every sometimes time. sometimes that looks like being a drunken master and sometimes it looks like I'm just going to throw cutlery at you until I can get a hit in. I'm going to burn this shut with this hot kettle. I mean, she just uses whatever's handy. And I really like that resourcefulness because I think, again, all of that speaks to her character. She She gets knocked down, but she gets back up. When she wins, it's through just like pure grit, tenacity, and creativity. And that's great stuff. And we're going to see it a lot here as we, you know, move into the into the climax, I think. It's classic Looney Tunes, right? We get to yes. see Harley yeah. be the Bugs Bunny like all of the time. And it's just really fun. If Bugs Bunny had fight scenes, they would totally look like Harley Quinn fight scenes. So <laughs> it's just kind of one of those bonkers characters, you know, it's she sometimes breaks the fourth wall. But not always. And, you know, even in her world, she kind of creates a cartoon world around her, right? Which is always so fun. It it also speaks to what makes a good action scene, right? Like, you have a number of scripts out there that essentially say, cool fight scene happens here, and then you leave it to the choreographers, and it's essentially a, a, a dance with violence. But what makes an action scene really work? And it's, you have problems, really pressing physical problems, and you need quick solutions. And make it as difficult as possible to get to those solutions. So she's shot. That's a problem. Get the kettle. That's a solution. She's thrown into this closet. That's a problem. What's in the closet she can use? There's a box cutter solution. And they make it work by doing that and also just tying it in with her character at the moment, right? She's fighting her family. <laughs> you know, they, they never lose sight of that. Um, it's This is one of my favorite fight scenes in the in the series. Yeah, that's hard to argue with. It's very good. Uh, Ivy's going to get one I'm a real big fan of, too. But this is, as far as dynamism, this one is great. It's the best one. Yeah. So moving the spotlight a little bit to our other things that are going on in that episode, let's talk a very little bit about Frank and then a little more about Ivy. (laughs) Mexico is right next to Brooklyn. I just want to point out that I love the idea of Frank having little misadventures. And once again, this is our opportunity that was missed by uh, 15 years of having a bunch of web shorts that were, you know, Frank and his weed dealer in Mexico. That's really all I have for Frank. I'm glad he's here. I love the little misadventures. I just want to point out that they're great. I have a question for you guys. You can tell me if it's just me, but this is I think this is a good way into this question. In in this episode and the next, is it just me or are the jokes a little bit less specific than they had been? Like here, like you have Frank needs to get to Harley and in his misadventures, the pot guy drives him off to steal hallucinogenic honey. <laughs> um, which does feel very nonspecific. And I noticed throughout the next episode, most of the most of the written jokes, most of the dialogue jokes at least, seem like almost 
completely random toss toss aside jokes that are less specific to the story being told and the characters on display and a little bit more like what's a funny thing that a person can say in an in a situation is it did any of you notice this also i didn't but it's interesting that you bring that up i'm thinking about it now yeah i'm kind of in the same boat like um I did not notice, so you're not saying something that I already kind of had in mind, but I am seeing, I'm seeing the point. And, and what's interesting to me is that all of the jokes that I can remember off the top of my head as being particularly good are by and large tied up in character stuff. So I think I'm forgetting the ones that are more generic that you may have in mind, which probably speaks to your thesis, right? It, it, it might. I didn't notice it the first watch through. And on the second, I was, you know, I, I take way more notes than I probably should. And I noticed <laughs> there are a lot fewer jokes that I kind of want to bring up specifically on this podcast because they really are kind of toss offs. Like, like, for example, and this is probably the most specific of the non-specific jokes I can think of in the next episode when our characters kind of dress up as goons with their hazmat suits and we have a slow motion walk and yeah, then they all kind of trip yeah. and fall down and I, I i had to kind of pause and think i've seen this in other shows haven't i and it, it 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 seemed like what is a joke we can do about people in suits well what if they walked in slow motion and it was goofy i it it had nothing really to do with the characters or the specific situation at hand kind of did it with the pretzel pretzel wrapped wieners it's like okay that that'll work sure yeah it's a little mad libsy yeah, I can't argue with that. I don't think that it took me out of the show since I didn't notice. Like, I'm not ready to talk about this. So I don't think it ruined anything for me. But you're not wrong. You know, I mentioned that we were going to start getting into the episodes where plot took over. Like, we weren't going to forget character, right? Mm -hmm. But it was, you know, the seesaw was going to tip more towards plot. And I wonder if that maybe had something to do with the types of jokes that they were able to get into the script. Maybe. I mean, the plot the plot moves forward pretty earnestly uh, in, in the next episode. Yeah. And then on the side, there are these jokes. And it could honestly just be me. It's just something that I noticed and wondered if I was alone. I'm thinking about the character Gus, the person who took Poison Ivy hostage. Is that correct? Yeah. His name was Gus? I believe that's right. Yes. The teacher. Okay, cool. I'm really glad that that's his name because he's my new favorite character. <laughs> I love that guy. I thought that he was so funny. I was laughing so hard. Somebody just being um, that earnest, but also completely evil at the same time <laughs> was just delightful. The fact that he like gets on a call with a parent, <laughs> all of that. I loved it so much. I thought that that was one of the best characters. And that character is completely not related to anything you know it's true so. yeah yeah no he really is very good we get an insight into his like hopes and dreams and his problems with his mom and he has opinions about kitten heels which is <laughs> that's a well-rounded guy he's just really yeah. together yeah i mean i always enjoy a kindergarten teacher who side goons to afford craft supplies <laughs> yeah no the the, the, the non-specific jokes there worked because that is who he is he's the kind of guy who doesn't really get into the doom and gloom of it. He's just really going to talk about the stuff that's important to him. That was so funny. I loved it. And the fact that she's trying to negotiate with him and his responses are <laughs> that he needs overtime or whatever. Yeah, I just thought that that was some of the funniest stuff that had happened on the show. Because, of course, that's the foil to Ivy, right? There's nothing she can do yeah. <laughs> in that situation. <laughs> she's uh, really good at convincing people, but she cannot convince Gus. I, I, I love Ivy in this episode, especially when, you know, she has to qualify her support for the Second Amendment, you know, to to a couple of people she already shot dead just to get it out of her right. system. And then as Scarecrow is about to like inject her with something, he says that insurance companies are the real villains. And she says, yeah, I agree with that. And then he injects her. Like, she's... I, 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 I love Ivy on this show. Qu question, plot question... Sarah, you mentioned before, Poison Ivy can't be poisoned. She says that on this show after getting poisoned uh -huh. like a half dozen times. I thought that I remembered yes. them explaining that away, and I guess they just don't. No, they, they did. They kind of do because they, they say, do. yeah, Scarecrow is like, well, guess what? I knew that, and I made this special extra poisony poison or whatever. <laughs> and it, it's based I mean, on that's... her DNA, so it works yeah. on her. Which I assumed was. Which is like. 
Mm-mm. Which I assume was different than the other <laughs> stuff she was being poisoned with, though, right? This was a new thing he just made for now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the whole idea that you're going to have a character who can do this thing and be like, but here's your kryptonite to that or whatever is always kind of like, yeah, I guess. But also, um, I just don't think that Ivy gets enough props for being impervious to poison either so the fact that they brought it up kind of late in the game probably means that somebody brought it up and was like hey you've got this character who can't be poisoned getting poisoned five times and they were like oh my god what can we do to fix that and it's like well obviously you can have the scarecrow just be like really good at it or something (laughs) and it's like okay but i mean She's so good at preparing, you know, so I just I just don't buy it. I'm like, eh. <laughs> it reminds me of a of a bit of a bit of dialogue in the movie. Thank you for smoking, which is about, you know, the tobacco lobby uh, where they try yeah. to get product placement for cigarettes in a movie set aboard a space station. And, and somebody points out you can't smoke in space. Uh, you know, it's impossible. Like you're, you can't light fires in space. It makes no sense. And somebody else says, "Well, they just throw in a line of dialogue where they say, well, thank God we have the filter, whatever, like something like that.'" And it's like, <laughs> yeah, if, when it comes to plot things that don't come from character, where it's like what a character physically can or cannot do, or what a device can or cannot do, they can just sort of invent it as they go. And it's like, well, I, you know, I guess you guys are you guys are in charge of this story world you've created. I, I do appreciate they lampshaded that part. I just thought it was funny that they lampshaded it for this new thing that drives her insane and not for every other time that she's been dosed <laughs> in the last two episodes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that they do a really good job of illustrating how powerful Poison Ivy mm-hmm. is over these last few episodes. I think that her actually getting to break out and be a really physical person and kind of jumping on the semi trucks and you know she has to break out you know she has a lot of moments that are uh you know we haven't really seen this side of her we've seen her kind of shut things down because of how powerful she is but we haven't really seen her be challenged or need oh, to that's true, commit yeah. a long-term goal mm-hmm. <laughs> such as you know shutting down th- whatever that's that's later the harley quinn highway later but <laughs> You know, she does all of this work, I guess, you know, in these episodes where she actually is being, you know, challenged in ways we haven't seen. So I think that, you know, it has to be intentional on some level. They probably just really wanted to challenge Poison Ivy. Obviously, her getting kidnapped over these last episodes gives us the plot reason. I don't want to be so cynical and be like, well, it's all just because they needed this for this for this (laughs) or whatever. But, you know, because that's every story. But I also really appreciated that they took the time to make us see in action how completely more powerful (laughs) than any other character Poison Ivy is. So because of that, I can forgive the poison thing, but (laughs) I'm also just like side eye. Not because I am the most clever person in the world, but honestly, the whole we just mixed herbicide in it. (laughs) is such an easy out and it's right there because they're dropping herbicide on her from the ceiling you know it's i don't know why they went to the effort of even talking about it if they were also going to talk about it in this weird how about some dna stuff it's so it's weird the herbicide thing was like come on (laughs) well but at least it's it's easy and you can cruise right past it you can be like oh plant killer sure checks out and just keep moving but no we've got to dink around with dna and bring it up and never really put it to bed i mean i guess the argument the argument (laughs) i make most people could but (laughs) the argument i I make against that i guess is by saying if this new fear toxin like has your DNA or whatever, like that makes it seem like it was really difficult to do this to her. If you say, oh, we mixed in herbicide, it has the potential of kind of diminishing her in our eyes of like, oh, it turns out all you had to do is mix in like a really basic gardening tool, you know? Okay, I'd like to think that when I say I mixed herbicide with it and I'm talking about the scarecrow that I mean more than Roundup. I'm just saying, (laughs) but you make a fine point nevertheless. But he's all, you know, he's also not really trying to straight up kill her there, right? He's trying to implant nightmares in her in her mind or whatever Scarecrow does. So, eh, 
<laughs> for no reason. Can we say another nod towards people understanding their villainous characters? Because some of them are multi-layered and interesting and nuanced, like Joker and Lex. And some of them are like, well, it's not not about me, like Black Manta. <laughs> or every time Scarecrow opens his mouth, it's either idle gossip or let's give him some fear toxin. Yeah, that, you know? that line where he says to Joker, what if we had a labyrinth and put people in it and dose them with fear toxin? And Joker says, wow, you are one note. You know, I... I, I... <laughs> I, I, I enjoy I enjoy what they did with Scarecrow in this in this show just because he's he's always been kind of basic, right? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean he's only got the one the one guy. A lot of Batman's villains, even the really good ones, only have like the one thing, and uh, and it's good to go hard on that. You know, um, not every single person who decides to put on a costume and rob banks is suddenly going to become a really like interesting and nuanced character. Some of them are just heels who mm. have a fear toxin or a f coin flipping fetish or whatever you know um and it's it, i actually think it's good writing and interesting writing to sometimes accept the fact that your villains aren't all going to be super interesting oh except for whenever he's on gotham because that version of the scarecrow is all over the place <laughs> and really enjoyable but if you didn't watch gotham and or don't count Gotham, <laughs> then yeah, he's always been completely basic for sure. Cause he's, you know, he's the horror fan, right? He's the basic horror fan. Who's just, I want to see more guts. He's just like, hmm. I want to make people scared. <laughs> this, this brings us back to Bane though, doesn't it? Right. There's the version of Bane that is a mastermind calculating, able to basically defeat Batman at, at a match of wits as well as a physical battle. If you want him to be your main villain, you can do that. Because this show has nothing to do with Bane, Bane's just in it, we can reduce him to a kind of a, like, you know, maybe self-aware, but still childish, um, I want to blow things up guy. Same with Scarecrow. If they wanted Scarecrow to be a primary villain, they they could have made him more complex. But, you know, he's he's really just a sideshow for the, for the villains we care about on this show for the for the people who actually right. move and shake and make choices he's he's a henchman essentially so they're they're playing him down if they had given him more complexity it might have overburdened the show so you know they oh totally yeah but so th i'm glad that they made him non-complex in a way that fits with the character as opposed to a way yes. that makes us look at him and say okay they just sort of dumbed down this character for some reason and right yeah that okay that is a really good point Flattening a character down to their most basic elements is a very different process than just flattening them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did it with Superman, right, too. Like we already talked about all of yes. those characters that were kind of side characters that get flattened or uh, they get kind of condensed, I guess. And it, you kind of just see how they come off to people who don't know them, like Harley. <laughs> Harley is looking at Superman just like, who is this guy? And sees, <laughs> you know, him speak his three lines. And that's, you know... A testament to how good the writers really are in a lot of ways is that they are able to do that. And I think that's a really good word choice, too. The difference between condensing the character versus flattening it out. That That's excellent. Thank you. But there's also a, a difference between um, kind of ignoring the inner life of a character or, or eliminating the, the inner life of a character or saying they have an inner life. Their, their inner life is very basic, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Like Scarecrow on the show has an inner life. It's just that if we looked into his head, <laughs> he's just thinking about fear toxin. Same, you know, see, <laughs> all the time. You go into Superman's head on this show. He's thinking about, you know, his his life with Lois and the fact that he ha that he has to, you know, be around to save the day. It's not that they don't have inner lives. It's just that their inner lives are what you see is what you get. As opposed to some shows yeah. where they might write a character who just has no inner life, and you look at them and you think. This person does not seem like a person. It just right. it just seems like a prop that you threw in there. Um, and that happens. And on this show, I, I appreciate that they, they keep them characters. And I think we might finally get some of that with Psy in this episode. You mentioned that, that Psy is actually now, he has things he actually wants instead of just yeah. being a source of jokes. Yeah. Sai was the turnaround surprise for me over the last couple episodes because he really made me laugh a bunch of times and I was very surprised by that and uh, yeah I guess now I'm team Sai I was surprised by it but it's true yeah I, I appreciate that they veered away from uh, the the Jewish stereotypes and that even though he still has the accent and all that 
it's no longer really the point of him. It's no longer the thing that we're supposed to take away from him the first thing we look at him. Um, they they do fall into, you know, ageist jokes, right? Like, <laughs> he's he is the old oh, man yeah. stereotype. And, uh, you know, there's one joke that maybe goes a little, eh, like, as, as a Jew, which was uh, in the second to last episode when Ivy wants to use his phone and he's stingy about, is it is it long distance? You know, like, that, that maybe goes a little, eh, you didn't have to go there. But in this episode he's he's fun i mean he he wants to be part of the crew because he misses the glory days he wants to be helpful um he's a trans changer which was <laughs> I, I i i i love that i love that he monologues the whole way through it but it just looks like the most painful thing possible and everybody reacts to it like it's the most disgusting thing they've ever seen <laughs> Everybody's faces. <laughs> so funny. So great. There's a lot of vomit jokes in this episode, or at least at least two, right? I, I guess they're both Clayface, but Clayface vomiting, <laughs> reabsorbing his vomit, and everybody, and it, it, the little smile that he has on his face after he does that. It. I don't have a comment for that, but I appreciate it that they did that with Sai. It's a moment, though. It's a little character moment. I don't know what it tells us about Clayface, but it is definitely telling us something <laughs> it's, about Clayface. It's an animator having some fun there, at the very least. But I appreciate it that right. at the end of this episode, you have this horrible new status quo. And also the grossness of Sai as a car and Clayface vomits. Like, that's what puts him over the edge. <laughs> that's fun. That's fun. You can You can play with that. I have kind of mixed feelings, as you say, about the ageist jokes, but the the old guy falling asleep while on guard duty and then also being shockingly effective at guard duty, it's pretty good. Like, you kind of get it coming and going, you know. <laughs> the joke is he's not very good at it. The joke is he's actually so good at it, it horrifies the supervillains. Why would these guards commit suicide? <laughs> <laughs> They can't deal with it. They can't deal with it. It's really good. I like, yeah. I I think it's also a pretty good joke that he went through all of the effort to be a trans changer and it turned him into a station wagon. <laughs> the CIA has a budget, apparently, you know. His 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 uh, pretzel wiener truck gets towed because it's in a handicapped spot, which he could technically qualify for if he wanted to. <laughs> Right. But I'm off the grid here. Yeah. It's, yes. Good jokes. Good jokes. Um, how do we feel about the trip into Ivy's mind? Now we get to look at Ivy's brain. Did we enjoy this as much as Harley's? There's less deep diving, right? right. We don't yeah. find out that much about her life, which is fine because everything is overtaken by fear toxin. But I thought that it was really creepy and it was very telling that her inner monologue or whatever is going to be a lot more downbeat and kind of terrifying mm. just as a character trait overall, even if it wasn't <laughs> for the fear toxins. <laughs> um, and then, of course, finding out, you know, she has the Grim Reaper or whatever that comes after her. Frank as, a, as the Dante of the <laughs> story is really funny. Um, but yeah, she has that kind of realization that the thing or I, Harley has the realization that the thing that Ivy is the most afraid of is Harley. And that is the most love story thing I've ever heard. So they kind of just go th with that, I guess, for like the rest of the episodes. And that's a really interesting conversation. And it makes them have probably their realist and most honest conversation of the entire series. So though we don't really find out much about Poison Ivy, I appreciated it as a plot device, right? Like getting yeah. to the next point yeah. via this, I thought was pretty fitting and good. It definitely creates a space where a conversation won't just fix the problem. You know, that there was a place where that might have worked before, and we are well past that. And rather than it's pretty economical as far as storytelling goes. And here is why you are literally her worst fear It's pretty, pretty good stuff. And for that to be juxtaposed with them being the cutest couple, like in the same episode is excellent because that whole conversation about the dessert menu. And because mm. I always forget that we have cookies at home. I was like, <laughs> you two are a couple like just figure it out. You know? I know. Yeah, it was very touching. I loved a lot of that. I thought that it was really telling, you know, that that's what was so prominent in Ivy's psyche, too, is that we don't see anything else, but we see Harley, which, 
you know, in some ways is selling Ivy a little short because she has a really interesting backstory herself, but that's not really the point of this yet, right? So maybe we'll find out more about that later. Mm -hmm. So kind of just seeing Harley's prominence in Ivy's mind, even and almost especially whenever she's experiencing uh, extreme fear, I think is, you know, obviously really telling and kind of great for a storytelling device. And all around, it just told me a lot about their characters, I guess, because I was uh, I was expecting, you know, it'll be herself or something, you know, like I've watched a lot of Ingmar Bergman mm-hmm. movies. I think that <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of uh, she is her own nightmare, you know, all of that. And then I was like, no, because Harley is Harley's own nightmare. But Ivy isn't Ivy's worst nightmare. Ivy likes Ivy, you know, I like that this is their priority, right? Throughout this whole episode they they have to rescue ivy from literal prison they have to prevent the destruction of gotham although sidebar i don't really know why they they're so invested in saving gotham but in any case throughout that whole chase um the one thing harley really cares about is so why am i your biggest fear and the (laughs) way ivy puts into puts it into words is yeah no it's it's perfect it's i like my biggest fear is trusting somebody and then being uh, than being uh, ditched uh, and you know point and pointing out Harley's flaw which is or at least one of Harley's flaws which is quote you still live your entire life based on what he might think like they're getting to the heart of th- what what these characters have to overcome and I'm glad that they make it clear that Harley understands this because she's so used to not listening to Ivy having her verbalize Ivy's mad at me for months of emotional neglect it's like okay good you get it and then she wants to atone for it. She's going to blow up her statue. There's a statue of her. Um, <laughs> like, but I, I appreciate that this is this is the episode where they understand they understand each other a little bit better, right? Harley understands how Ivy really feels about her, at least to a degree, and she understands what it is that she herself has to fix. And also throughout this episode, she's she's you know, gunning down her flaws one by one, right? Like she's going to her crew and apologizing for using them to get her own aims and forgetting about their own needs and being a bad friend. She gets it. And I I, I appreciate that they're not forgetting that amidst all of the plot because there's so much plot of this episode. Yeah, and the Joker is an external threat. He's not really an internal one at this point. She almost completely forgets about him in a lot of ways. So that's pretty interesting to me as well, is is that now her conflict is fixing the things that she did wrong, you know, but there are things that are not at all Joker related. Joker does things outside of the situation that makes it, you know, we have to focus on him. But Other than that, she's just worried about everybody that she really cares about. And Joker really doesn't enter that, which is, you know, that's a lot of growth for 13 episodes. (laughs) (laughs) She apologizes to each of her crewmates, asks if they'll come back. They say no. She mentions Ivy's in trouble. They're immediately in. (laughs) (laughs) You buried the lead. (laughs) (laughs) Gotta put your thesis at the top. (laughs) I'm going to have to spend the rest of my parenting career not saying that to my son in Frank's voice when we're working (laughs) on an essay for school. Because that is just in my mind now, friends. And it's good advice. And the fact that I get to deliver it like Frank is going to make it really hard not to do that. (laughs) Yeah. I'm sorry for my son. Uh, Kiddo, you're going to be listening to this someday. I'm really sorry. I'm sorry for all of it. (laughs) I do think it's it's interesting that she, you know, she apologizes for her flaws correctly. She she identifies what her what her problems are, apologizes, tries to amend. And while Ivy essentially forgives her, right? Like it's like they go through the motions of actually like coming to understand each other and Ivy forgives her. The crew never really does in this episode. I don't think they ever do textually, right? They just sort of you know, gradually are her friends by the end of all this. But in this episode, at least, nobody says to her outright, um, we forgive you and we're back in. They're just on the mission with her at this point and fall, in, fall into the familiar patterns. But at the very least, she's no longer neglecting them. And I appreciate that they, when when they have Harley blow up her statue as a mea culpa, they also kind of make the point of, 
that in it in itself doesn't make it right you know like she has to then turn to ivy and say like so am i forgiven water under the bridge and then cut to the literal water under the bridge getting poisoned it's like okay well <laughs> in itself that act isn't going to resolve all of the problems but at least you're on the right track yeah i think that all of these characters had some interesting growth moments through this and i think it's finally time for us to discuss chekhov's highway oh, <laughs> i yes. love the highway <laughs> The Mario Kart Highway. You all brought it up earlier. You earlier in the uh, recordings, you were like, "This is going to come back," and I was like, "Well, I wonder how that's going to come back." And then <laughs> there is no bones about it. It definitely comes back in the biggest way possible. <laughs> it comes back five or six times as little throwaway gags, and then here uh-huh. it is—the best big action set piece. Man, it's so much fun. <laughs> I'm questioning some of my creative decisions. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Yeah. Good God. Tax dollars actually paid for this? <laughs> right. Get the loot crate followed by taxpayers paid for this? Like it's, yeah. And the thing is, what, what, I, what I appreciate about them giving that joke to Psycho is that very shortly, we're also going to be making a bunch of jokes about how taxpayers dollars also bought tanks. And I feel like that's not an accident. <laughs> like we are supposed yeah. to feel just as oddly, just as sideways about tax dollars buying tanks as we are about tax dollars buying the Harley Quinn highway. Oh, yeah. Although the Gotham citizens seem to like that they paid for tanks. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Feels like there's commentary there, too. Yeah. Hmm? I think. But just as as a visual action sequence, the physics here are so great. <laughs> and, and this is such a showcase for ivy's abilities as a fighter right like this is yes i i would love to see a live action version of this because you know i would probably puke but it would also be great right (laughs) oh too much gopro as long as they do it with very little gopro because otherwise yeah we're all gonna vomit in our uh clay i guess i have one question for you guys there's sort of a throwaway line to explain it in the next episode, but why do you think Harley and Ivy really care about saving Gotham from Scarecrow? What is their motivation there? Because <laughs> they've been pretty happy about being villains planning big destructive things for a while now, right? Like in even in the Legion of Doom, Harley's issue with the Joker's Tower was that it wasn't destructive enough in theory, right? And, you know, kind of spoiling ahead they don't mind the the destruction at the end of the series so what is driving them now why are they suddenly being superheroes oh i have no idea i think maybe just their responsibility in it and or the fact that they really just want joker to be taken out right but yeah it is interesting because uh you know, consistent to the comics as well. We've really never seen a Poison Ivy Harley Quinn matchup that gave a shit about <laughs> Gotham that much. <laughs> they kind of seem to like the idea of it getting destroyed for the most part. Um, Poison Ivy certainly, you know, via her own hands has destroyed massive parts of Gotham before, um, you know, and also created wildlife preserves. So, you know, she's complicated. But yeah, I don't know. I was kind of wondering about that myself. Just like, well, I guess... uh they're just trying to turn it around for a second, I guess, and be really nice because uh, it's reasons. 100% <laughs> their fault that it happened. Yeah, but like it makes it makes sense when Joker pops up, right? Once once Joker enters, I completely get their motivations. Why mm-hmm. should they care about their own hand in this? I guess is my question. Like why why would their responsibility in in this be a problem? What is at stake for them personally? I don't I don't see it. And then in the next episode, like Har- like Harley just mentions that if Gotham is destroyed, they'll have to move to Metropolis and that would suck. But <laughs> that's not really a reason, I guess. Like, I, Okay. I got a little backfill. Okay. I think I can help. Cool. Okay. I think that there are a few different things going on here, right? Like, I think that uh, the tip of the spear, as far as like a personal investment, is Ivy. Ivy doesn't mind breaking things with her power, She, however, takes great issue with some man with a sack over his head breaking stuff with her power. That is valid, that they they took away her agency in in all this. Yes, and I think that she... No, I think that's it. I I mean, I can tumble (laughs) that out, but I think the agency is, is the biggest part, is that she's like, they're using my stuff without my permission, and I am not in control of it. 
And I am not okay with that in general. And I am specifically not okay with that if it's this guy doing it, you know, Scarecrow doing it on behalf of all these other guys that I hate. It really is just like taking something that's vitally hers and making it theirs. And so I think that's where it starts is that she doesn't like the destruction with her power that she's not in control of. But I do also kind of like a delineation in my villains where sometimes I just have costumed criminals, like they get a freeze gun and go rob a bank, right? And sometimes you get some masterminds that are kind of in an inter intermediate space. And I think sometimes uh, Ivy is that way, like when she's destroying parts of Gotham. But then at the top, you've got world beaters, you know, you've got your Lex Luthors and your dark sides and I'm not going to say Maxi, but you get me. <laughs> and I think that even though it's a little bit of a throwaway line and it's in the next episode, I like the idea of people, even though they're villains, loving their city, you know, like really having an affinity for their city so that even if they'll blow up some of it, they don't want to destroy all of it. And I feel like Harley is a, a really good vehicle for that, like somebody who just moved to Gotham and fell in love with it, you know, mm -hmm. so... I think I get a little bit of that in the Birds of Prey movie also, but not not tons. But she just knows her neighborhood so well. And she's all you know, she's wired into it. And maybe I'm reading an appreciation for her neighborhood and her city into that. But that's what it felt like to me. Yeah, a, a slight. I mean, my, my only real slight counterpoint to that is she sure doesn't really care about her neighborhood at the end of the show. Well, I think things have escalated to the point where Joker has been destroying things for a month before she gets to that point. I don't know. We'll see in season two, but I can imagine them being very sorry that they broke it, but not sorry at all that they broke it in the process of breaking Joker, if that makes sense. Fair. I don't know. We're reading in. It's none of this is <laughs> yeah. supremely textual, but I think we can get there. Yeah. I, 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 if I had a note for them and they had the ability to make changes, I would say kind of clarify where what their stance is, like what destruction is okay, what isn't. Um, yeah. But I, yeah. I think what you said about they forced Ivy into this, right? They captured her. They stole her DNA. They created this while, while intending to kill her. Like, I could I could see, like, okay, you don't want them to succeed now, <laughs> especially with that. And the rest of them are chasing after Ivy, who's chasing after the trucks. Right. So I think that's another where that comes from for me, is that the, the crew is there to save Ivy, and then Ivy runs off into more danger for Ivy's reasons, and they chase after her because they're still saving, you know, they're there for Ivy, um, which is also kind of everybody learning some life lessons, which is cool, very cool. I have one more item from episode 11, and it's mostly about the writers taking a moment to make me feel really old. Thanks so much for the Felicity season two reference, you guys. I was <laughs> literally aged as you said it. So <laughs> even she couldn't pull it off was the joke, <laughs> yeah. right? Yes. So good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Yesterday just was actually Carrie Russell's birthday, which I know because it was my birthday. So <laughs> Carrie Russell from Felicity. Happy birthday. I never saw Felicity. Well, that's that's why I was wondering, actually, is... Um, how familiar anyone is with Felicity anymore. I mean, I was in college watching that show. So of course I was like, oh, you jerks. But it seemed like a very unlikely joke for this show, which you mentioned actually, Avishai, that there's- <laughs> Yeah, that was one of them. That, that was one of the yeah. jokes that was kind of nonspecific. You make a good point. <laughs> yeah. It's like, here, here's a reference to the fact that a show from a while ago had a, uh, a bad haircut choice for a main character. A while ago, I appreciate you going with that instead of making some <laughs> horrible guess. That was very, I, that was for me, and I appreciate you. Huh. Late 90s. <laughs> Indeed. What a time. So, episode 12, here we are. Great setting of stakes, I think, at the beginning of this with Ivy unable to control the plants. You know, I mean, all of us were thinking it. Why doesn't she just tell them all to chill out? And she can't. Yes. <laughs> There is that great moment later in the episode where she can't control the beanstalk and tells Dr. Psycho, like, of course I can't control fairy tale plants. And Psycho <laughs> says, how would we have known that? When would that have come up? Like, I, I, that, that's good lampshading. You know, if, if you're going to control yeah, that was the funny, stakes by saying what your characters can or cannot do, make it, make it clear that it, this is not obvious to anybody. Right, right. 
it harkens back to a couple of other times that Ivy said, you know a thing, and we did. Like, I'm thinking specifically of her plants having names. Right. She said that, <laughs> and we were like, well, we didn't know, but that makes a lot of sense, so okay. And in this case, it's like, well, we didn't know, and this doesn't make any sense, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know I can't control fairy tale plants. Like, of course they don't know that. But that brings us back, Queen of Fables. And I love having Queen of Fables around. Very exciting. I do have one quick question. Queen of Fables had been in that book for 30 years. The Justice League put her in there. The Justice League all looks about 30 years old. How are we supposed to deal with time in this show? (laughs) (laughs) Comic book time. (laughs) Yeah. Only now it's on television. But it's comic book time that they recognize as comic book time. And I don't know how to deal with that. (laughs) Oh, because it might be different if you're actually in the book, right? And that's always something that pops up in sci-fi all the, or uh, fantasy stories almost all of the time, right? Whenever you're in Narnia, time passes differently. <laughs> I just imagine that Superman and Wonder Woman, etc., don't age. <laughs> right. Yeah. But that's the thing. Normally, we just don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> and in this case, here we are having to confront it. And I'm like, I actually kind of like that. I, I mean, I really do. It makes me think thoughts, but it also makes me go, this is the right way to do it. Just reference stuff being a long time ago, even if it makes no sense for it to be a long time ago, but it feels right. That's probably the best superhero <laughs> approach at this point. The Joker would have been eight years old. <laughs> right, right. Yes. No matter which age we believe, he would have been too young. <laughs> My 25th birthday party, that was one of the funniest jokes, too, because immediately it was funny. Nobody thinks that he's 25. <laughs> Every I just was cracking up at that one right it's away. It's also so him. <laughs> it It, it oh, is yeah. him, because it's like, who are you trying to convince? You know? like Yeah. Scarecrow. To, to call back to other comments we've made about him, that's 100% the kind of comment that someone would make expecting that nobody would ever push back on them. Like everybody knows it's crap, (laughs) but nobody's going to push back. And he leverages that. It's a good joke. That's also a character moment. And that's kind of becoming a theme of the show. Most of the time. It's the same. It's the same kind of man who says, Oh, I'm just reading infinite jest. Have you ever heard of that? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, actually that I knew a guy who used to walk around with a copy of the stranger all of the time and that book is only uh, like you know 120 pages long or something he carried it around with him for like a year and a half and he would always pop it open if he didn't like what was happening in the conversation around him and stuff and i would always be like how's the book going (laughs) super like (laughs) confrontational and mad so that made me kind of laugh because i was like Yep, I think that there's there's definitely that guy. I've definitely met that guy specifically <laughs> who's like, look at this book I'm reading about being alienated while I'm acting in a really alienating way at a show or a party or something. And it, I would always just be so um, very specifically annoyed by that, I guess. <laughs> so, I appreciate that in your sense. real world situation, you were the Harley well, that spine looks oh, yeah. pretty intact to me, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think that a lot of, and I don't know how gender specific it is, but I think definitely a lot of women have had uh, guys try to impress them by reading <laughs> and stuff, <laughs> where you're just like, I just don't think that that can be that impressive because I read all of the time, you right. know, and the fact that, you know, that you're reading The Stranger and you think that that's like the most profound thing that you could possibly read <laughs> is kind of <laughs> hilarious. And it's the same with Infinite Jest, right? Yeah. It's right. totally a book that people read just to be like, look at how smart I am, though. And it's like, yeah, but I read that book when I was 14, you know, <laughs> like right. I read a lot as a kid. So I don't know. I've just seen that a lot of times. So I appreciate it. A the friend joke. of mine and I made a short film a few years ago where one of the gags in it is there's a secret like address uh, to a, a secret like hidden place that you can find if you actually like get to the end of Infinite Jest like it's like on one of the last pages but nobody actually reads the whole book so nobody knows <laughs> <laughs> the secret message that is too secret indeed and the thing is the thing is it's Joker making a joke while also trying to look really smart doing it it's like he's his own worst enemy in that moment where it's like we get it you're the Joker it's Infinite Jest also you're taking this seriously this is a mess. 
Right. It's so planned. And, <laughs> you know, that's always something that's really hilarious is when somebody puts that level of um, dedication into how they present to other people, especially intellectually, and that you can just immediately see through it if you're somebody who's like read more than five books, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and it's I, I I don't mean that in like any kind of a mean way. Like nobody has to read books, you know, whatever. <laughs> but uh, I definitely mean it in the way that there is that specific guy in the world. <laughs> like I'm sure that the screenwriters have met that guy. The Joker has never <laughs> read a book in his life. Yeah, exactly. Never. And I've met people who certainly haven't. And then they always want to be like, well, yeah, I was just reading, you know, this Bell Hooks book or something. It's like, (laughs) they're always trying to make themselves seem like they're super smart. And it's always just like, I wouldn't judge you. You know, like I wouldn't, I don't judge you for how many books you've read. I don't approach the world that way. But whenever somebody just kind of point blank lies about something in a way that is very easily disproven, (laughs) it makes it be like, yeah, that spine looks pretty intact, but like, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's an uncomfortable position to go. Well, I wasn't judging you before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens a lot actually in life, where you're like, I didn't even come prepared to judge you, and here we are. <laughs> it's it's the Streisand effect, but on a human. <laughs> But the Joker's the right guy to make that gag, too, because that, that gag's technically in episode 13. And in episode 12, I have to tell you that Generalissimo Joker is a fantastic look. I, I appreciate just how much of a narcissist they're making him. He lives in a tower with all sorts <laughs> yeah. of paintings of himself and his face on every button in the elevator. And he dresses up his his military to have to look like him. And he one of the like draconian laws he enacts is forcing people to laugh at his televised jokes. And if they don't, he'll, they'll, right. they'll, 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 like it's, he wants one thing and it all stems from the fact that he is a complete narcissist. And I like yep. that version of Joker a lot more than society has wronged me. So this is what they deserve. You know, no, no, mm-hmm. he's, a, he's, he's just, he's just a narcissist. Right. Yeah. I think that that's always a problem with Joker and how he's treated. I'm sure I've talked about it before, but just the idea of him being so much more complicated is like, but in the comic, he's always been kind of set up as this guy who just doesn't see past himself and his immediate needs. And I think that that's, you know, it's not a likable character (laughs) for me, but it's definitely one that has to exist, right? And it's kind of what we've defined him around. I mean, I haven't seen the Joker movie. I'm probably just going to skip out on that one. But yeah, I think that there's a big difference because him kind of being, you know, I'm so sad about this. Society has wronged me. This is the anger and the angst that everybody deserves to have. We already have a lot of characters that do that, but Joker is one of the only ones that is this narcissistic. Yeah, I, I, you know, I enjoyed the movie enough. It's just that's not my preferred version of this character because I don't think we need to explain why somebody's this kind of a jackass. This type of jackass exists in the world. We we all know this type of jackass. So it's totally yeah. yeah. It's nice to just sort of exaggerate one into supervillainy. It, it, it's right. Just take take a person you actually know who is not the kind of person you want to spend any time with. Turn them up to an eleven. Give them a gimmick. Supervillain. Yeah. And it it's okay. It's okay if that's it. <laughs> it justifies itself. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. The tautology of Joker's supervillainy. So the Justice League show up again. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like this a lot because, again, they're kind of goofballs, but also trying to give gravitas to the moment. They're earnest. Yeah. Yes, yes. But they're also, they have a camaraderie, right? It's like like Wonder Woman says to Superman, like, uh, do you want to say it? And then eventually when they have to say it again, uh, you know what? You can say it this time. They they have they have <laughs> that pre-existing relationship. They're friends. They've, they, they've been here. I like that. Also, I like that when Queen of Fables yeah. shows up, she calls Superman sexy. Yeah, right. that was hilarious. <laughs> Very it's real. It's so real. Yeah. 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 And Ivy holds the, the lasso of truth and says that she hates paper straws and was excited for Jazz Fest. The kinds of gags you can do with the Justice League around. <laughs> I was really excited for Jazz these Fest. These jokes are a lot more, <laughs> these jokes are a lot more specific. Like, these next two episodes, I feel like the jokes are a lot less scattershot. What funny thing can a character say? Like, now it's back on what is relevant to the story we're telling. (laughs) 
Yeah, I am always apprehensive of how Wonder Woman is going to be portrayed. I thought that this was pretty good. And the fact that she's the person who gives them a benefit of the doubt and puts the lasso on, the fact that Poison Ivy was that quick of a thinker. Mm. All of this stuff is like casual, funny jokes, but it all tells you stuff about how the characters are. So yeah, once again, this is one of the moments of the series where you're just, you know, blown away by how good a lot of the characterization can really be. Speaking of, because we kind of leapfrogged over him to talk about the Justice League, Harley finds out about Kite Man. Mm -hmm. And she's She's so mad. And she's so mad. (laughs) I was completely scandalized. I was just watching it like, she is mad about it. (laughs) (laughs) And of course she is, you know, like it totally makes sense because she was just kind of expecting Ivy to hang out until she's like ready or whatever. (laughs) And it was just kind of hilarious. And then. You know, I mean, it's interesting here, of course, because there's no prioritization of Kite Man for Ivy at all whatsoever. She, They kiss and they have these moments. And, you know, he's super into her still, obviously, in a way that's kind of gross. <laughs> but he um, doesn't take up any space in her head almost, you know, like we see the inside of her mind and it's Harley, Harley, Harley. Like he makes a cameo, <laughs> you know, where he's getting disintegrated, Hell, nah. but he's not actually a player. <laughs> and... You see that through this entire interaction, you know, the whole time he proposes and she's like, no, nah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, and, you know, he reads that very differently, of course. But I think that it's interesting to see how much Ivy doesn't really care about Kite Man that much. Like she says that she loves him, but she doesn't do anything that would indicate any kind of prioritization of him over Harley in any way. And or I mean, even equal to Harley, even remotely equal to Harley. Yeah, it's true. So that's all really interesting. And then Ivy or Harley being really upset about it, I think is, you know, great because that shows that there's stuff that has been going on, I think, for both of them that neither of them have really focused on or wanted to acknowledge. And I think that that's a lot more organic than what I thought that they were going to do with Mm, it. mm -hmm. So I thought it was pretty great. Uh, that, That organic stuff goes both ways, too, because when Ivy is insisting that she wasn't even working very hard at hiding it, I was like, let me translate that into English. I was acting out and hoping that you would notice. (laughs) Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that that was all over these last couple episodes or the last few episodes, not only prioritizing how much they do prioritize each other, but also how much other people don't exist that much (laughs) in that, in that uh, (laughs) relationship, which is very different than a friendship, you know, or, you know, I just think that that's where you start to see the lines being drawn, right? Mm -hmm. Where you kind of go, there's no way that they're just best friends because I don't care if my friends date (laughs) other people. (laughs) They should do that. You know, that only makes sense. I've had friends date guys that I really didn't like or something, but I'm still just like, you know, maybe it'll work out. I have a positive idea. You know, I want to be more positive. That's kind of how friendships work a lot of the times. Like, it's hard to watch people make mistakes, obviously. But, you know, you you don't want it to be a mistake. Whereas here, Harley is immediately convinced that it's a mistake mm-hmm. and is super pissed about it. <laughs> so that's different. Yeah. I mean, he serves a purpose for her, right? Like he will never ditch her, so she can she can totally. rely on him yes. always being there, and that's that's really all that she needs from him. Um, and one thing I, I do appreciate, like, like you said, Joshua, like how she wasn't even hiding, and everybody else in the crew knew. It's just that Harley, you know, if it's not about Harley, Harley doesn't pay attention. Um, yep. Like she, she said, she's been coming home reeking of kite. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> but I reeking of kite and twigs in her hair was a fantastic line. I appreciate that she no longer has to hedge the fact that she is dating him. Like it's a thing that that everybody knows. She doesn't have to hide it, but she also doesn't know how to defend it. Right? Like whenever anybody asks her about it, she's just like, uh, it, uh, uh. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just sort of how it right. is for her. But she's not. She's uh, she's not necessarily humiliated about it anymore. It's just that she can't verbalize what it is that she sees in him because ultimately it isn't going to work out. I mean, he's not like yeah. he's one of those like he has an inner life. It's just, you know, it's one line long, you know, characters. Um, he, when, we, when we first see him in this episode, he's trying to design a new kite and he has three of the sides drawn and not the fourth <laughs> one. He doesn't know how what it, what it'll be like. He shows up flinging a hot sauce. It, he 
serves a purpose for the story and for the character and the characters are aware of it and it's no longer dangling over anybody's head as a reveal which i which like thank god because this could have gone in so many different ways and i'm glad that it's just sort of an offhand like yeah we've been dating i wasn't lying about it i wasn't hiding it um we're dating because i don't know screw you that's why and the only person who really 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 cares is harley <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah it's great. <laughs> I thought that it was really uh, good. And it's kind of true to the comics and how their relationship plays out there, too, where they kind of take a while to get around to it. And then at one point, Harley just kind of puts it together, I guess. And I think that that's how it has to be between them, because they're both such kind of, uh, you know, immediate gratification, but long term denial of needs. <laughs> so. Yeah. I think that that's just kind of how it has to be between them. I think it makes a lot of sense in ways that, once again, yeah, I think I was surprised by this one and how well they handled it because I walked into it definitely being like, I'm going to hate this so much. And it's been kind of uh, still a love story. Just kind of, I wish that they would stop calling each other besties, I guess, is kind of the biggest right, they part. They do keep calling each other that, don't they? <laughs> they do it about five times, I think, in the last two episodes. And I'm just looking at the screen like ah, just gals being pals I don't know. <laughs> Sarah here's how I read that okay and this may not help you but I noticed that also and it was bothering me so here's how I decided to headcanon it they're really starting to get close now right so it's like they're throwing up the last little bit of roadblock that they have like well we're best friends <laughs> of course it's like that because they haven't quite overcome that last you know the last hurdle for them to mm -hmm. be romantic. So they're just throwing up that last thing. And I think that you can already see kind of the chinks in the armor because I really appreciated Ivy saying that there are a handful of exceptions of people that she can love while she's literally holding Harley in her hand. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, there were things that I enjoyed about it. I think that obviously there's, and that's true to life for a lot of people, a lot of people whenever they're, you know, going through their coming out, there's so many people who I've talked to who have these stories of, yes, I was very clearly in love with this person. And that was probably very obvious to everybody around us. But the person who I was in love with just kind of liked the attention and hadn't gotten enough attention. And then I was giving so much attention that for us, you know, that seemed like a normal relationship that wasn't romantic. And you could, uh, you know, be like, I just care so much about this person because we're best friends, female friendships, right? <laughs> it's just like, after a while, you know, obviously, that turns into a realization for most people yeah. who go through it. Yeah. Because, you know, you think that friendships are so close and you're like, and, and I think that that's true. You know, I never want to say that friendships aren't as important or anything like that, because obviously friendships are, you know, among the most important relationships of our entire lives. And it's kind of hard to put one above the other in a lot of ways. But you see the differences in how with your friendships, you have boundaries. <laughs> you don't, <laughs> you know, cross for the most part. And then in relationships, there's different kinds of boundaries. I think that they've been kind of doing a good job of showing the different kinds of boundaries and why one thing is different than the other, right? And how it's kind of taking them a little while to understand that. But then once again, you know, as somebody who just has seen only that, you know, like so much subtext and so much like that never being fulfilled and it being pulled out of canon and like all of that kind of stuff, I'm definitely like, yeah, all right. But <laughs> here's this long history of times when that didn't work out and you know kitty pride is still straight or something so <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile kite man proposes which is hilarious <laughs> there's there's no box <laughs> i feel like that was the moment when i realized i wasn't actually going to feel bad when ivy cut kite man loose right because right he so understands what that moment means, but also can't let himself understand what that moment means. And that kind of little bit of self-deception I watched happen there, I was like, okay, okay. When she breaks it off with him, it's going to be okay. I am not going to feel bad for him like I thought I might. They might still play it that way because, you know, in this episode, nothing phases him, right? When she doesn't accept his proposal, he says, no, 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 hell yeah. When she, quote unquote, dies, they spend a lot of time on Kite Man's facial expression his reaction and it's very sincere and it's not played as a jokey version of loss like he looks devastated 
And I could totally see them doing something similar when they break it off of deciding that's the moment that they don't play for for a joke. But we'll see. I, I suspect that it's the kind of thing that, that they'll actually give a little bit of oxygen to because I think that's one of the things they prioritize in this show, these kinds of relationships. And That's true, yeah. So they, they might play, well, how we feel about it might not you know necessarily cohere with that. But I will say, like, Kite Man's reaction to her getting impaled and the, the look on his face did get me. Well, and then he's living in the park. Like, there's nowhere for him to be but right here by Ivy's grave. Right. It, it's jokes, and he's there with Frank, which also makes it jokes. But it's also underneath that is th- this bleakness, the sadness. It's authentic. Right. But it's also why there's no way that that can long term. Right work because obviously when somebody has nothing going on outside of you that sucks it's really terrible and it's hard to date that person because you know the fact that he will always kind of just put his entire life on hold just because he's like sad harley is immediately trying to do things you know she's immediately has reactions thinks of a plan you know it's not a great plan but she thinks of a plan <laughs> and i just think that that's the difference right is is that there's not really it's hard to find emotional fulfillment in somebody who looks to you for everything you know yeah it's not a healthy relationship it's going to fall apart Yes. <laughs> but I like it for now. And you're right that he's sincere. I mean, he's a sincere character in a lot of ways. He just doesn't really have that filter, right? So we see all of his sincerity, you know. He's just not particularly complex. His his inner life is what you see is what you get with him. Mm-hmm. So I had uh, one more gag from episode 12 that, uh, well, I had I had two things I wanted to point out. First of all, when Ivy looks at Psycho and says, fuck you, Psycho, I was like, you are all of us, but especially Sarah. yeah i've relate to ivy really hard in a lot of ways but this is definitely one of the (laughs) most prominent there's a line in the previous episode where harley says gentlemen and psycho you know right (laughs) (laughs) the uh the other gag i really liked and it's centered on ivy and she delivers it so sincerely and yet it's so ridiculous that i had to write it down i had to talk about it when she breaks one of the mutant trees yeah. in half and she just has this look of horror and says, my God, he was just a kid because she counted the rings. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, tree jokes aren't supposed to be that good. That tree <laughs> joke is hilarious. Yeah, she is good at them. Yeah. Also, I want to point out that when she grows, she becomes attack of the 50 foot woman to the point of even imitating the pose on the poster. Yes, yes. Totally. The costume and yeah. the pose. 100%. <laughs> so I appreciate that a lot. Um, the line, wouldn't it be messed up if I ate you right now? I don't know why that <laughs> got me so much. Maybe it's just the deadpan <laughs> delivery of it. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out how much subtext there is in that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's all subtext, but it's also a completely genuine and hilarious line. Right. So <laughs> it's definitely one of the most perfectly written lines of the entire <laughs> series, I think. Uh, just joking, unless. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> So Harley knocks off Queen of Fables' head. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's a lot. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah. we definitely needed to take her off the board, right? Like we needed to know that she wasn't going to be a problem. And that's after we've set her up as a very serious threat. But man, that's not messing around. They just decided, mm. oh, okay, I guess we're just really writing this character off. I appreciate it in the last moment before that happens Queen of Fables gives Harley props for being ruthless because she, with, I guess, King Shark's help, hollows out the grandmother wolf <laughs> and then wears the corpse. Like, mm, props. Like, yeah, so that's uh, that's on track for her character as somebody who, as a villain, believes that you should not have a line. I guess uh, I guess that is mm. a certain level of ruthlessness. But also, I, I'm still just completely surprised that they decided, how should we defeat Queen of Fables? Let's knock her head off. And include like a little blood geyser and everything. I I could totally imagine them in the writing room throwing out ideas for how they could accomplish this and just deciding, screw it, she hits her with the baseball bat, her head comes off. Right. I think that a big part of, 
uh, fables in this last little bit is we start to see her not go full out trying to kill Harley, right? We see her use the beanstalk, which if she wanted to kill Harley, she would have definitely killed her (laughs) instead of sending her to a place where she would very likely be able to escape just knowing what we know of Harley. So I think that, yeah, and you see that kind of whenever the Joker's like, well, you should kill, kill Harley. And she's like, fine, I'll kill, kill her. <laughs> like, so she goes out, you know, and I think that she does it without the intention of actually killing Harley. I think that what is happening is, is that she's being a lot softer to Harley than almost anybody else. Like, I haven't seen her be soft on any other person <laughs> at all. Mm-hmm. And she's used to people that are like Superman, you know, and she can just kind of go off on and know that while she has a great amount of power she's probably not going to win the fight i guess but yeah i don't know i definitely thought that there was a lot of interesting stuff with that character over the last couple episodes i love to see her again it was really nice to see her kind of just pop back in and be like you thought that i was gone but guess what now i'm teamed up with your ex-boyfriend the most evil thing i could possibly do so (laughs) what's up i thought that that was all really good and i appreciated the fact that you know we kind of see her like harley a little bit even though she doesn't ever want to say it. Yeah, uh, she she claims that she just wanted to, you know, off Harley in the most cinematic way possible because that that giant usually just kills everybody. Um, but yeah, no, she she's definitely little like less hands on than she was with Jason Praxis. You know, she's not going to let this just be a one off <laughs> like side thing. Like she's going to let this be a whole a whole debacle with wolves and whatnot. I like that she decided to team up with the Joker just because she likes a winner and because she points out, you know, unlike unlike Harley, he's a quote-unquote real evil son of a bitch, um, which just reminds us of the lines that Harley's unwilling to cross and the lines the Joker is willing to cross. I was slightly confused by whose evil plan was whose, and on a rewatch it made a little bit more sense. I guess the Legion of Doom was behind the whole Scarecrow thing. And then the Joker's tower was an interruption of that. I wasn't 100% sure. Doesn't really matter. Harley has tendered her resignation with the Legion of Doom. Uh, Just one more box to check off on her arc. (laughs) That's true. There's not even a Legion of Doom for her to quit, you know, anymore. That's how over that part of her life is. Yeah. The Joker takes that away from her. She was going to blow them up and self-actualize and said he blows them up instead. Although he did use her idea, which I guess is kind of, kind of nice. (laughs) Multi-layered, but it's also, multi-layered. But it's also, you know, man taking credit for a woman's idea, which I suppose could be the commentary they're going for. All right. and So Ivy's dead. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's it. So Ivy's dead and we're in the final episode and it's all coming to a head. This is a lot of how I feel about the, the all these episodes that are really good and they're full of jokes that are also really good. But I'm like, yeah, this is basically what I wanted to happen. You know, overall, um, everything really... Uh, With the exception of them doing such a big game changer, I don't think there was any way that I could have seen it coming. But otherwise, it's basically what I hoped for, you know? It does what the show needs to do. I have like one caveat uh, about the episode that I'll say later, but this is solid and it's still character based. And even the sort of relatively minor characters get their moments uh, and it all comes back to the thematic head. So... Yeah, I think that it was basically everything just kind of tying together. So in a lot of ways, this might be the least that I have to say, I guess, because you just see every resolution, right? They set it up pretty good, I think, overall. I, I like uh, the the graveside uh, funeral for Ivy. I like that it, it gives each character a little moment to be themselves. Oh, the flowers that were springing up whenever she fell or whatever at the end of, I think, the last episode. That was really beautiful. The flowers, there's Frank demanding that they add the, <laughs> the word doctor to the gravestone. <laughs> She's a doctor, damn it. <laughs> there's Clayface plagiarizing Wrath of Khan. There's Kite Man saying, goodbye, my dear fiance. <laughs> <laughs> what a moment of self-control it must have been for everybody to not go, wait, what? You know, because nobody there bought that. Right. But the big thing here is that Harley, her reaction is, I'm just going to storm the castle, right? She has, she kind of skips over the make a plan part. She's just going to rush straight at Joker Tower and attack. And it takes all of her friends to tell her, we know that you're upset right now and probably more than the rest of us, but you need to actually think this through. And that felt authentic. It reminded me of Ivy's bursting into the 
TV studio again, right? Like now Harley is feeling that sense of danger and loss for her bestie. You can hear the quotation marks. Her gal pal. Um, Her gal pal, if you will. We're just killing Sarah right now slowly with our words. (laughs) Yeah, I don't like those ones. (laughs) But I mean, you know, they describe a phenomenon. (laughs) You guys can both drop dead and stop that. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, but yeah, I, I liked that big emotional reaction from Harley. That felt right and on point. Um, Frank's heartbrokenness and demanding that she be remembered as a doctor. Uh, Kite Man falling apart and living in the in the park. All of these things just make the most sense, you know, the most sense ever. And here's the thing I could not stop thinking about, even in the midst of this very funny cartoon show. Joker is in charge of Gotham for a solid month that Harley has to be on the run and he has her crew that entire time. And after all the life lessons she's learned and after losing Ivy, I can imagine that the month of her trying to figure out what to do to save her crew must have just been excruciating. Was it a month? I thought it was a week. Early on in the episode, they say a week. And then there is like a kind of a montage. And when we come back to Joker, he's talking about his birthday month. And uh, Scarecrow is saying, you've been in charge for 30 days. Imagine, you know. Um, So Mm. I think we have two time lapses, which is a little confusing. Huh. That is interesting. I, I Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's kind of like the 30 years ago, the Justice League trapped me in a book thing. But time has definitely passed, and now we're in a fascist state run by the Joker, which I, which, listen, I will always prefer narcissistic fascist Joker to agent of chaos anarchist Joker, just because I think the, the anarchy version of him is, is a little bit more lionized. It's almost, it's almost like, oh, wow, he's, he has a point. Anarchy is the way things work in the end. And I like the idea of like, no, he has a massive ego. And if he took over, it would not be anarchy. It would be, it would be authoritarian. Um, But I don't want to skip over the fact that Harley does try to team up with Batman to take him on before he's, before this month passes, right? Yes, she does. She actually, I think, succeeds in teaming up with Batman. Her plan is pretty good, actually, considering. Except that Clayface, Clayface can't uh, keep in character. (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, there's always a weak link, right? <laughs> there there are a couple of moments in the uh, Batman on the roof with Jim Gordon scene where Harley tries to tries to make the alliance that just slayed me. And one of them is Batman saying he works alone and Jim saying, what about me? And I was asking, what about Robin? Because Robin was such a big character right. on the show and he's just right. non-existent anymore. Um, but the other is the greeting card that plays music that the Joker swapped in for his file has him surfing like he surfs in the 1960s Batman show. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I, I just appreciate that kind of a deep cut. But yeah, so Harley teams up with Batman. It fails. And then we get a montage of the Joker just being specifically sadistic to each member of her crew in ways that range from genuinely dark, scary to just kind of silly, like forcing uh, Dr. Psycho to watch rally videos of to watch videos (laughs) of feminist rallies like that's the show knows what it's doing there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He throws Psy down the stairs because he has a wheelchair i don't know how a disabled person would take that (laughs) i feel like that's the place where you realize the writing staff isn't sure what to do with psy because i I mean pulling king shark's teeth is not exactly super personal but we also have had him brag about being a shark many times over the course of the series so and that hurts tied into that and it hurts yeah um whereas psy just gets thrown down the stairs which seems like you could do that to any buddy <laughs> yeah it's uh but it, it's specific to the sense that he has a wheelchair i guess but like still it's you know they're they're varying what punishments are genuinely dark scary torture and what is just sort of silly and i think the side one's meant to be silly and I, I have to imagine that there are some viewers in wheelchairs who are watching that and saying uh, yeah i i don't really want to laugh at that so i i can't speak for anybody but that was a thought that crossed my mind Absolutely. Um, but him executing anybody who doesn't laugh at his jokes is great. Him 
uh, molding Clayface into his own face. I, I feel like they probably could have gone for something a little bit harder there if they wanted to. I don't know what it would have been, but... <laughs> <laughs> Before we dial in on the big moment with Joker and then the big moment with Ivy. There is a sequence worth talking about before we get to the big Harley Joker moments uh, that I think is perfectly in character for Joker. I have a guess. What is it? <laughs> so he's been God King of Gotham for God knows how long. And he is bored of torturing Batman because he has everything he's ever wanted. And it's not like he actually has a bigger goal than just win. Uh, And Scarecrow pulls off Batman's mask. And the Joker hates that because that's the one thing he had left to look forward to. And he really didn't want to ruin that. But the thing that really upsets Joker is Scarecrow insinuating that Joker misses Harley. Because Joker keeps mentioning their time uh-huh. together and scarecrow says he just pulled off the mask because it's something that harley would have done and he thought the joker would like it because he keeps talking about harley over and over and over and that's what makes joker kill scarecrow and i'm glad it was that and not just the mask pull yeah that's really good i mean i feel like those are two things that would really irk the joker and they're like in that venn diagram they're not a circle but there's also some pretty clear overlap uh but yeah both of them together really justifies the murder of Scarecrow, you know, in as much as we're justifying fictional murders. I just realized saying it justified the murder of Scarecrow made me sound like a monster. So I caveated. But it's Scarecrow, though. So, (laughs) yeah. So goodbye. (laughs) Goodbye. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, I mean, from the perspective of maintaining the abusive relationship element, I, you know, we've been focusing so much on Harley's end of it and on the Joker's abuses towards her. And it's interesting to kind of get into the mind of of somebody who is that abuser and is in denial about how much he cares. Yeah. Yes, it's nice to see that she's actually a source of vulnerability for him also. Not because I want the Joker to have vulnerability, but because I want Harley to be that big a deal in all respects. Yeah. I mean, when they do have their fight and the Joker says he has one weakness left, you, once I get rid of you, I'll be happy. If he succeeded, he would not have been happy after that fact. He like No. He, even, he, and he, he even knows it to a degree because he's the one saying, if I kill you, you'll be an emotional martyr in my heart forever. Um, but like whatever he does to her, there's no winning for him anymore. He, he won't find the joy of being the winner because there's nothing left to win and he doesn't actually believe in anything he doesn't actually want anything specific he he has everything so it's i i appreciate it that they had that for him because again it's so on point for his character there is no victory for a narcissist like that it's just always going to be striving for more of that validation yeah absolutely one thing that struck me on this watch was that and I mean, it's it's a rough scene a lot of times, but I think because I've been thinking so hard about this show this time around, when he insists on her putting on the old leotard, I was like, oh, this is violence. Yeah. You know, you know, like it just it like I say, it was always a tough scene. I knew how it was kind of supposed to land and something about this time. It really just landed on me. And I was like him forcing her to wear that against her will especially after all the the growth she's had just in the last couple of three episodes is just man it was aggressive like it really it it twinged me in a way that it hadn't the other times that i watched the show yeah definitely that is one of the minor ways of abuse right that turns out to be kind of a major thing i think that her complacency towards the role too is interesting because it kind of shows us that she's grown a lot since then and that that is very boring to her to be in this position of okay what do you need from me i'll do the thing like you know she's very annoyed with that now and that's you know it's interesting to see i guess that's kind of i agree with you that that was one of the more uh, kind of insidious things you know because it just indicates the overriding of her personality. Mm-hmm. He's just doing it to hurt her, to possess her. And he's essentially holding a gun to her head, forcing her to do it by threatening her friends. So it, it they're, they're, they're bringing it back in this finale to show us how far she's come and to show us what she's escaped, what she's still trying to escape. 
Um, it's I'm glad that they don't really play it for laughs in itself. They do bring in the you know the uh, the Sorkin impersonation there when she when she uh, is singing the the Happy Birthday song at the front gate. Yeah, yeah. Um, but once she's wearing this costume for him. She still refuses to give an inch. She's still being her new self, struggling to fight for that independence. And it brings back the thing that really impressed me from the start, which is when she broke up with him in the first episode, that was not overcoming her flaw. Or not not her flaw specifically, but that wasn't escaping her problem. He still had real estate in her mind. And at this point, she no longer wants to impress him. Uh, she no longer wants to show him how well she's doing without him. And I think that this this particular scene makes it really stark, especially when they both sort of pretend to be into each other again and then stab each other. You know, that that's a concrete way of showing how she's changed. One other thing that uh, that I thought was really interesting about this sort of final showdown is that in the end, Joker says, you know, I can't just kill you. I have to unmake you. And a thing that was on my mind more this time, because again, this close watch has brought some stuff out for me. Our discovery in Bensonhurst that there was an awful lot of Harley Quinn in Harleen Quinzel well before Joker came along. And him standing there and having the audacity to say, this will unmake everything about you that is Harley Quinn. This will this will undo Harley Quinn and then I won't have to worry about it anymore. And at the moment that he said that this time around, I was watching going, oh, I don't think it will. I mean, even, you know, plot MacGuffin hand wavy stuff aside, I was like, no, 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 no. There's so much more of her that's her than is you. I don't think this is going to do what you think it's going to do. And that he was sort of going to defeat himself in that process if Ivy hadn't shown up. Yeah, I mean, so this is something that I have questions about. (laughs) <laughs> from sort of a, a plot standpoint, but also just from a story standpoint. I feel like this particular undoing acid is a Chekhov's gun without a man the place. I, I feel like introducing it in the last 10 minutes of the show as this thing that apparently has the power to undo her personality. They're not really specific enough on what that is for yeah. me. I wish that they made it clearer because I don't know what's at stake. He's going to throw her into acid that will what... He says it will remove everything that makes her Harley Quinn. Is it a mind wiping, uh, like mixture? Is it, you know, does it like d- empty out her brain? Does it just remove the pigment from her? What does it do? And she's really scared of it. She says no, anything but this. I wish that they had done another pass of explaining what exactly is this because this has come mm. so out of left field and it's entirely, it's entirely conceptual. And I don't really know what the concept is yet. So I, I wish that they had kind of gone further into what in, into what Harley's afraid of here. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that that's a fair request. Uh, I also, I think the way that I viewed it was just to be, you know, the Joker just says things. <laughs> and, um, you know, he, they don't add up whenever you look at them later. But in the moment, he presents them with a lot of sincerity. And so... You know, I don't know. I guess uh, that was just my read on it. But then at the same time, even if it would just be a lot better, you know, if we kind of figured out exactly what this did to her before and what she's afraid of it doing now, because we find out that, you know, she is afraid that it's going to completely rewrite rewrite her personality. Um, I don't really know any chemicals that do (laughs) that in this way um, while leaving the body like completely unhurt. So, or I mean, died, you know, like, I mean, it's it's all kind of strange. Um, so yeah, I would agree with that. There's no science behind that at all. Um, and maybe it would benefit from it. But even sort of beyond science, like what, what you're saying about the Joker just says things, she takes it really seriously. I, I would have thought that she would push back on it, but she takes it, she takes him at his word, whatever his word is. Um, I, I don't know what the consequence of this scene is if Harley fails. What would happen to, what would happen to her? How would it affect her character? Because mm. if, if it was just, I'm going to throw you into this acid and you'll die. Like at least I get what that means. If it's right. if if what the writers are saying, no, we're going for deeper than that. This is this is uh, something that will affect her as a character. I need a better sense of what that what what they mean. Get, get specific. What element of her is it? Her memories? 
Is it, does it make you complacent? Does it remove your violent tendencies? Does it make you, uh, does it make you compliant with the first person you see? What does it, what about her will it change? So anyways, that's, and that's something that I guess we'll see in the next season because of that last little moment after the Joker falls in. But that's, it would have been good to know uh, if it's going to be the climax of your entire season. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't argue with that. It did feel, I didn't have quite this many robust thoughts about it, but it did feel a little fast or incomplete, you know, in the moment. Um, like I understood what they were doing and that was fine enough, but it was me understanding it instead of feeling it. Whereas we have felt things very deeply the rest of this series. So it is a little bit of a, a little bit of a fumble at the goal line. In any case, Ivy comes back to life with a new look and rescues her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so that they can talk about Harley's tears of friendship. Was it my tears of friendship? Yeah, that's exactly what a closeted lesbian would say. <laughs> 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 was it my tears of friendship? Wow, yeah, that's probably what it was, Harley. <laughs> Also, just textually, I like that Harley is emotionally invested in her being the one who brought her back. So, I, you know, Ivy says, it's not a Disney movie. It's the nurturing power of nature that brought me back. And she sees that Harley is disappointed. And so she has, so she's like, well, but it might have also been the tears. <laughs> you know, that's, that, that, that's such a lovely little moment. Gang, they are the cutest couple. Just legit. Um, and there's one last bit of gaslighting that the Joker gets to do as he's being thrown <laughs> into the, into the, um, mystery acid uh where as he's you know you know he's already said you're nothing without me and she reiterates everything she's been saying this whole show that she you know she is her own person he's falling into the acid and he says i've always supported strong female friendships (laughs) (laughs) it's a great line to go out on it's not like the strongest line without context but the context of 13 episodes behind it really makes it a great line for him to go out on, I think. It was very good. It's also a callback. He yeah. said, ugh, female friendships in like the first episode, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. They've done a great job with callbacks. I forgot to mention, I mean, even Harley in the Wolf's outfit is a callback to Joker in his billionaire suit. Like they <laughs> they do a great job like building up to things um, in this in this show, which is probably, to your point, why we're a little underwhelmed by mystery acid, you know? Yeah, because that's they, they were going for something character there and they didn't really commit. Now, I'll say for the finale, like I said, this is basically what I expected to happen, right? Like a final confrontation with the Joker where she'd come out on top. I knew Ivy was coming back. You know, you know all that is as expected. What I did not expect were these massive game changers that they pulled off at the end. Batman is apparently dead. Joker is apparently unjokerfied, and Gotham is apparently now doing no man's land. And I just really wasn't <laughs> expecting it. What about you? <laughs> that was hilarious whenever they're like, he'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> that was so funny. Because, yeah, he'll probably be fine. But it's so funny just to watch Batman be the guy who does jump literally in front of something to save them and for them to be like, Ew. Yeah. <laughs> That's true to the comics. Um, No Man's Land. Yeah, it is totally almost No Man's Land already. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I thought all of that was really fun and good. I hope this is Bane's time to shine (laughs) in the next season. Oh, yeah. It has to be. That would be nice. That would be nice. I do wonder, and I've said this before, but now that we're back to it, why is this destroying Gotham? Like, why is this Joker destroying Gotham okay? And the last Joker destroying Gotham is the thing they have to all stop. Uh, I think it's a little, like, even on sort of on an emotional level, like, I could imagine they might have their own lines, but they don't even end with, like, well, I mean, I guess this is okay for us. They end with, this is beautiful. So what? Yeah. What is the show? <laughs> this is what we've always wanted, <laughs> this episode. <laughs> Harley draws a line, but if it's millions of people, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a little confused, but, you know, I I, I get it. When, it, when it's important for us to believe that our good guys are good guys we want them to do heroic things and when we want to enjoy their villainy we can enjoy their villainy i wish there was slightly more consistency but i I get it (laughs) totally well i think we should probably wrap this whole thing up with final thoughts sarah i'd like to start with you as the person who came to this near a blank slate yeah i mean not with harley but with this particular iteration 
And I kind of right. drug you into this and I appreciate you coming. So how does it mm -hmm. all end up I was going to have to anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it ends up really good. I really loved this series in ways that I kind of wasn't expecting, considering the fact that I was so sure I was just going to be bristling at every Kite Man appearance <laughs> and every Gal Pals reference. You know, I, I was already prepared to be like, I hate this, you know? Um, but I loved Ivy's development. I loved Harley's development. I think a lot of the characters that I was really iffy on going into, I ended up enjoying a lot. I thought that their Joker was perfect. I mean, he's exactly what we need for a Harley story. That's for sure. You know, somebody who is that manipulative and that she has to overcome that manipulation. Watching their uh, delicate nature whenever they are dealing with abuse and trauma and what the long-term effects of those are, not excusing the person that abuses, and then also kind of offering somebody who has to kind of get their stuff together also, you know, like saying this is wrong, but also this person can't keep treating people that way and has to get better. So the person who deserves an arc gets an arc. The person who has only terrible things to offer the world doesn't get an arc. So yeah, it was really good in surprising ways. Avishai, what about yourself? Final thoughts? I had a blast with this show, and while I have my criticisms of it, you know, there, there are things that are kind of more endemic to media in general that this kind of f fell into as opposed to things that I think this show, uh, I guess, transgresses. It's, it, it, it's stuff that I can compartmentalize, the stuff I don't like about this show, and the stuff I do like I think works really well. I think... And let's talk about the visuals also. Like just putting aside all the story stuff that we've been talking about uh, for this whole, you know, podcast arc, um, it's a good-looking cartoon. It the character designs are great. The uh, just the composition and the shots, the backgrounds, the colors, the action. The, it it it's a good-looking show with its own its own style, its own identity, uh, and it matches the tone of the stories that they're telling. I think that the humor is really funny. I like that it's willing to go into dark places. I think, I think I'd, I'd be interested in knowing what both of you would put on sort of a wish list for season two. Not like specific plot points or character things, but like, what do you think the show could do better next season, which comes out in like a few weeks now, right? Uh, by the time our listeners are hearing this, it will have been out for a couple of weeks. Yes. Oh, there you go. So uh, what do you think the show can improve on uh, from your own personal standpoint going forward? Obviously, I'm just going to answer more kissing. <laughs> um, I think that they should kiss and then they should kiss some more. Valid. That works. <laughs> <laughs> I like also, you know, a lot of the small appearances that we've seen of characters, maybe they'll capitalize on. And then also just the introduction, I think, of a lot of new characters, because this that's been one of the most consistently good parts of the show, is seeing these new kind of not usually focused on characters hop up. And sometimes they have good characterization. Sometimes they have good characterization, but it's, you know, as we said before, really condensed. So just kind of those condensed character beats, I think, are so vital to the show. So I'd love to see more of that. I also wanted to real quick agree with you on how good this show looks mm. and how that, you know, that'll only continue because they're obviously doing it on a really small budget. So I just appreciate that a lot. And I'm excited to see how it looks going forward. So I'm going to echo Sarah's desire for more kissing. Uh, definitely just all the kissing between Harley and Ivy. I'll come down with that. After that, this may sound like a cop out answer, but I'm talking to two other writers. So maybe not. There are so few genuine surprises for me in media anymore. Um, you know, because I read a lot, I watch a lot, I critique a lot, I write my own things. I'm always thinking about like how stories go together and how characters work, all that stuff. And so it's not that everything is super boring, but it's just really rare that I see something that just shocks me with how much I enjoy it. And that happened to me with this first season of Harley. And it keeps happening because I've watched it over with several people and now we've really close watched it and talked about it and it really holds up. All of this is just like layers of pleasant surprise for me. And so 
my honest answer is I don't have a wish list because I don't want to think too hard about it. I really want season two to flip my lid as hard as season one did, but in a different way. So I guess that's it. I don't have specifics because I've been so pleasantly surprised by almost every part of this show. I re that's what I want. That's my wish list. I want that to continue. Yeah. And I think for my part, you know, I, I, I can harp on about how I want them to be a little bit more thoughtful in regards to making jokes about, you know, ethnic minority groups or, you know, var various groups in general, like, like focusing on who's the target of the joke. Like, I think they can be a little bit more thoughtful about that, a little bit more thoughtful about uh, engaging with these concepts beyond just the joke level. But aside from that, what this, what this season did really well, I feel, is track the character arcs and relationships. And to the degree that they were set up within this season, they're pretty much fulfilled, with the exception of, you know, Harley and Ivy as a couple, which, has, which hasn't which has happened yet. Um, Harley is self-actualized at this point. And what I would like to see in the next season is figure out what, what her arc is now. What does she have to fix in herself? What, where does she have to improve that she hasn't already improved? Because the last thing I want is for her to continue being a static character from where she is now. I don't want her to just be actualized Har uh, Harley, who's overcome her, you know, her abusive relationship and her own personal selfishness, continuing to just be herself. I want her them to figure out what is their issue now, be authentic about it, continue down that line, and continue to show change. Um, and I hope that they get into that with Ivy as well, since we had just a little tiny look at what she's afraid of and where she's coming from. I, I want to see these characters continue to grow. It's the short version, and I trust that they that they will go down that go down that road. Well, I feel like that's a lovely sentiment to end this mini series of podcast episodes about Harley Quinn. I want to say again how much I appreciate both of you devoting all of this time and all of this energy to talking about this show with me. Um, I mean, especially Avishai has never worked with me before, so he was coming into this uh, uh, not very eyes clear, and I appreciate that. And Sarah hadn't even seen the show, so she didn't know. She could have just been hating her entire experience, you know. So I appreciate both of you guys coming along with me on this and putting your time and energy into this discussion, because I think it was really good and that this is a show that can withstand this kind of a critical look. So thank you both. Yeah, thank you for having us. This was really fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah, Joshua and Sarah, this has been a blast. That about wraps it up for this animated discussion. If you enjoyed this conversation and would like to join in, come find us on Twitter. Sarah is at Sarah Century, Avishai is at Avishai W, and I am at Joshua Unruh. And the hashtag is animated discussion. Sarah, where else can people find you? I have a website, so people can find me at www.sarahcentury.com. Also, I've been doing some scripts for Behind the Panel through Sci-Fi, which is basically just talking, you know, about comics. And doing a couple of short stories. So I would recommend just checking out the website because there's going to be tons of projects listed. Oh, and Bitches on Comics, of course. Oh, yeah. All fine offerings. I appreciate all of them. <laughs> Excellent stuff. And Avishai, what about yourself? Like you said, you can find me on Twitter at AvishaiW. Remember that an animated discussion is a Pulp Diction Productions program and is 100% supported by listeners like you. To find out how you can keep this and our other shows in production, check out patreon.com slash Pulp Diction Productions. Show your support by pledging at Patreon or by leaving a great review on Apple Podcasts to make it easier for more people to find us and join in the discussion. The links to Patreon, Apple Podcasts, and Twitter are easy to find in the show notes. Thanks so much for joining us for this animated discussion. Until next time, stop with this Michigan nonsense! <laughs>